Letters and Responses by Ogden Kraut. Adam, who is he ex Mormons for Jesus following the leader's grand delusion? Seven deadly heresies, three witnesses worthy male members. Adam, who is he? By Mark E. Peterson. Part I. Adam, the Archangel. 150th Semiannual General Conference. October 4 5, 1980. By Mark E. Peterson. Adam, the Archangel. By Elder Mark E. Peterson. 150th Semiannual General Conference. October 4 5, 1980. Reprinted in the November Ensign, page 16 18. On a warm summer day, I visited the land of Adam and Amon in the state of Missouri. I had looked forward to this visit with keen anticipation, for I had never been there before. The place was beautiful, the fields were green, the hills were rolling, the entire landscape was something to remember. But more impressive than the landscape was the significance of the place, for here Adam lived and even their family. The stupendous importance of it all weighed heavily upon me. Here is where the human race began. This we are told by Revelation. See Moses 134, D and C 10753, 8416. Adam and Eve knew God personally. They saw him and talked with him. They were taught the gospel of Jesus Christ even in that early time which was long before the Lord's earthly ministry, for Jesus had been appointed to be the Savior during our premortal existence. The plan of salvation, therefore, was instituted among these first human beings, Adam and Eve and their children. Angels taught them. The family believed. They were baptized and began to serve God. See Moses 5. The scriptures say that as Adam tilled the ground and cared for the cattle and the sheep, Eve did labor with him, Moses 5 1. They were highly intelligent people, not at all like either the hominids or the cavemen, some claim the first humans to have been. They were well educated, having been taught by the Lord himself. What an education, what an instructor. Think of it, and remember that the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth, D&C 9336. These gifts were imparted to Adam and Eve and their family. No one else could teach them, because they were the first human beings. That task was left to the Lord and his angels. Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. Among them were Seth and Abel, faithful to the Lord in all their ways. And then there was Cain. They taught their children to read and write, having a language which was pure and undefiled given them by God, see Moses 6 6. And a book of remembrance was kept among them, recorded in the language of Adam, and all who called upon God were allowed to write in this pure and undefiled tongue, by the spirit of inspiration, see Moses 6 5 6. And thus the gospel began to be preached, from the beginning, being declared by holy angels, sent forth from the presence of God, and by his own voice, and by the gift of the Holy Ghost, Moses 5:58. And from that time forth, the sons and daughters of Adam began to divide two and two in the land, and two till the land, and to ten flocks, and they also begat sons and daughters. Moses 5:3. It was a glorious period until Satan came among them. That evil person defied the teachings of God and said to the children of Adam, Believe it not, and from that time some of the family loved Satan more than God, see Moses 5.13. They apostatized from the truth. These dissenters lost the spirit of God, and as a result became carnal, sensual, and devilish, see Moses 5.13. With these evil attributes always comes retrogression. We should not be surprised, therefore, to hear of cavemen living in the dawn of time. One of these dissenters was Cain. He made a dreadful covenant with Lucifer and persuaded others to follow him. Adam and his wife mourned before the Lord because of Cain and his brethren, Moses 5:27. Cain hated righteous Abel and coveted his flocks. He was encouraged by Satan, who told him he could obtain Abel's sheep if he would kill his brother and thus seize possession. The first murder resulted, rebuked by the Lord and cursed because of his tragic sin, Cain left Adam and Eve and went to live in a place called Nod. The Church of Jesus Christ was well established in the time of Adam. See Joseph Smith, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, Comp. Joseph Fielding Smith, Salt Lake City. Desert Book Company, 1938, pages 157, 169. Men like Seth and Dennis grew to become the early patriarchs of the Church, and through them a long line of priesthood leaders was established. Adam held the keys of the first presidency and stood directly after the Savior in authority, see Teachings, page 168. He received those keys in the creation, according to the prophet Joseph Smith, who added, Christ is the great high priest, Adam next, Teachings, pages 157-58. Who was Adam that he was privileged to begin the human race here on earth? 
Had he been some very special personage in the primordial world? Indeed, Adam was very special and very important. Before coming into mortality, he was known as Michael. The prophet Joseph Smith clearly identifies both Adam and Michael as one and the same person, an angel, the chief angel, or archangel, of heaven, the special servant of God in Christ. When Michael came into mortality, he was known as Adam, the first man, but he was still his own self. Although he was given another name, that of Adam, he did not change his identity. After his mortal death, he resumed his position as an angel in the heavens, once again serving as the chief angel, or archangel, and took again his former name of Michael. In his capacity as archangel, Adam, or Michael, will yet perform a mighty mission in the coming years, both before and after the millennium. This is startling, but the scriptures declare it. One important assignment that awaits him is to be the angel to sound the trumpet heralding the resurrection of the dead. The scripture reads, Behold, verily I say unto you, before the earth shall pass away, Michael, mine archangel, shall sound his trump, and then shall all the dead awake, for their graves shall be opened, and they shall come forth. D&C 2926. What a marvelous calling for Adam, or Michael. But note that even in this assignment, which is yet future, he still will be an angel the archangel, but an angel nevertheless. Section 107 of the Doctrine and Covenants, dated March 28, 1835, identifies him as an angel, as of that date a little more than a hundred years ago and calls him Michael, the Prince, the Archangel, D&C 10754. During the millennium the devil will be bound, but afterward will be freed for a short time, during which he will rally his evil forces to make one final assault upon God. Who will lead the defending armies of the Lord? None other than Michael himself, whose position as archangel qualifies him to be the captain of the Lord's host. Is he not the chief of the angels? Then should he not lead them into battle against Lucifer? As the archangel he continues to serve the interests of the Lord with respect to this earth. His ultimate exaltation, of course, is fully assured, but it must await the completion of his work here. Seven angels are to sound trumpets, to announce a series of events, to precede the second coming of the Savior. Michael will be the seventh of those angels. Says the scripture, and Michael, the seventh angel, even the archangel and please note here, how the Lord still identifies him strictly as an angel, for that is his status and now I repeat this scripture, and Michael, the seventh angel, even the archangel, shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of heaven. And then cometh the battle of the great God, and the devil and his armies shall be cast away into their own place. D&C 88 112, 114, emphasis added. Then can anyone honestly mistake the identity of Adam, or Michael? Even after the thousand years of the millennium are over, he will still retain his status as an angel the archangel and a resurrected man. In the year 1842 the prophet Joseph Smith spoke of Michael, or Adam, who visited him. Joseph identified him as an angel even then the archangel and said, the voice of Michael, the archangel and of diverse other angels, from Michael or Adam down to the present time. D&C 128-21. He thus listed Michael, or Adam, with the other angels. So, in 1842 Michael, or Adam, was still an angel, and will continue to be so through the final winding up scene of this earth. Adam was not our God, nor was he our Savior. But he was the humble servant of both in his status as an angel. Then what is his relationship to the Savior, and to God our Father? Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God, the firstborn to our Heavenly Father in the Spirit, and the only begotten in the flesh. Jesus is the Holy One of Israel, not Adam, not anyone else. Although we are all spirit children of the Father, Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, in mortality, even from the beginning, not Adam, not anyone else, see Moses 5 9. This the Lord himself says. In the day that the gospel was given to Adam, the Holy Ghost fell upon him, and the divine voice of Jesus Christ the Jehovah of that time said to him by the power of the Holy Ghost, I am the only begotten of the Father from the beginning, Moses 5 9. Then, can anyone claim that distinction for Adam, or for anyone else? Of course not. Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father, even from the very beginning. Shall we not in full faith accept this doctrine, which is so clearly set forth in Scripture? Christ is the Lord. He alone is our Savior. The Apostle Paul has an interesting passage in his epistle to the Hebrews. He spoke of the Savior, and declared him to be in the express image of his Father's person, then he asked this question, Unto which of the angels said he God at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Heb. 1-5, emphasis added. 
And of course the answer is immediate and obvious none of them none of the angels, not even Adam, or Michael, the chief of the angels. Jesus of Nazareth was the only begotten of the Father. In this passage Paul was speaking only of Jesus the Christ. In the very next verse, as he continued to speak of Jesus, Paul called the lowly Nazarene the first begotten and declared, let all the angels worship him, and this they did including Adam, who adores the only begotten of God, the Savior Jesus Christ, and is always subservient to him. When the Apostle John wrote one of his most familiar passages he said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John 3 16. Emphasis added. And who was thus given of the Father to be crucified? Who wrought out the atonement on Calvary? Jesus of Nazareth. He was the only begotten of God. He alone was the sacrificial lamb slain from the beginning of the world. Adam was the Savior's progenitor only in the same sense in which he is the ancestor of us all. God had only one begotten son in the flesh. But Adam had many, including Cain and Abel and Seth. He lived nearly a thousand years. He could have had hundreds of children in that time. Then how could it be said by anyone that he had an only begotten son? How could all of his other children be accounted for? Were they not all begotten in the flesh? Were Cain and Abel and Seth and their brothers and sisters all orphans? Was any child ever begotten without a father? Adam was their father, and he had many sons. In no way whatever does he qualify as a father who had only one son in the flesh. Yet God our eternal father had only one son in the flesh, who was Jesus Christ. Then was Adam our God, or did God become Adam? Ridiculous. Adam was neither God nor the only begotten son of God. He was a child of God in the spirit as we all are, see Acts 17 29. Jesus was the firstborn in the spirit and the only one born to God in the flesh. The Almighty himself repeatedly called Jesus both his firstborn and his only begotten. Then who is Adam? He is Michael the archangel, appointed by God in Christ to be the mortal progenitor of the race. At this very moment, in the year 1980, he is still in his position as the archangel whose trumpet in the final days will herald the resurrection and who will be the captain of the Lord's hosts in the final defeat of Lucifer. He is the Ancient of Days spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and as such will meet the faithful in that same valley of Adam on the Amun, which is named after him, see Dan. 79-22, D&C 116. At the close of this dispensation he will there deliver up his stewardship to Christ, his Master and his Savior, the Lord Jehovah, who in turn, will give his accounting to the Heavenly and Eternal Father of us all, see Teachings, pages 122-157. 167 68, 237. If any of you have been confused by false teachers who come among us, if you have been assailed by advocates of erroneous doctrines, counsel with your priesthood leaders. They will not lead you astray, but will direct you into paths of truth and salvation. I bear you my solemn testimony that this the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints is indeed the Church and Kingdom of God. Jesus is the Christ. Spencer W. Kimball is his prophet. We are the legal and divinely chosen custodians of the restored truth. This I testify in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Part 2. Adam, he is God. A letter to Mark E. Peterson. November 13, 1980. By. Ogden Kraut. November 13, 1980. Elder Mark E. Peterson. Church Office Building. 47 East South Temple. Salt Lake City, Utah. Dear Elder Peterson. For over 10 years I have been writing letters to the general authorities of the church, but so far they have never responded. They have never sent me a letter, given me a phone call, paid me a visit, or invited me to their office I have never received so much as a picture postcard. I was getting discouraged. Then I heard your talk on Adam at conference and I said to myself, by golly, I've just got to write them another letter, anyway. Your talk was obviously an extension of your book Adam, who is he? which has won for you the acclaim of contemporary Mormons as being the authority on that subject. For this reason I would like to ask you some questions. In the opening sentence of your book, it says. In the minds of many people, Adam, the first man, is a controversial figure. So is Eve, his wife. Together they are probably the most misunderstood couple who ever lived on the earth. Adam, who is he? Page 1. After reading your book, I realized how true it was. Your fellow apostle, Bruce R. McConkie, wrote, cultists and other enemies of the restored truth, for their own peculiar purposes, are supporting false assumptions concerning Adam. 
I surely do not want to get mixed up with those kinds of people, so I would appreciate some answers from you concerning this very important subject. False assumptions. The first false assumption I would like to get clarified is the validity of Brigham Young's conference talk in which he said that Adam is our father and God. 1. You have made considerable effort to clarify both the wording and interpretation of that sermon as recorded in the Journal of Discourses. And your book, Adam, who is he? You devoted three pages to Elder Charles Rich who wrote a slight variation from the text written in the Journal of Discourses on the critical portions of that controversial sermon. You said that Rich's account was correct because Elder Rich, who was present and heard the sermon. Hence the correction that he made. Page 17. However, in the book on his biography Charles Z. Rich, Mormon General and Western Frontiersman, it is reported that Charles Rich was in San Bernardino on March 24, 1852, making preparations to leave for Salt Lake City. This is substantiated in the Hacia Stout Journal which says, when. 21 April 1852 Gen. Rich and some 15 others arrived today from California by the South Route All Well. This is also confirmed in the Deseret Weekly, May 1, 1852, and in the LDS Journal History of April 21. So it was satisfying to note that in the 1979 edition of your book, you corrected your first edition and stated that Rich was not in attendance when Brigham Young's sermon was delivered. But it was rather amusing to read where you said the sermon was written by C.C. Rich in his own hand, when the fact is that it was in the handwriting of his son Benny Rich, who had not yet been born. Joseph Fielding Smith also contended for years that Brigham Young was misquoted in that sermon, but at the same time his fellow apostle, John A. Witzow, contended that it was not a misquotation, but rather a wrong interpretation. My, what a tangled web we weave. 1. Elder George D. Watt was in the audience to hear Brigham Young's talk, and he was a professional stenographer who wrote the entire sermon for publication. Many others who heard that sermon wrote it down the same way that Watt did. 1. One and a half years later President Young's sermon was published in the Millennial Star, Bowl. 15769-770, which was identical to the one published in the Journal of Discourses. If it had been transcribed with such an error in the journals, wouldn't it have been corrected by the editors of other church periodicals? 1. If Brigham Young would have made such a preposterous blunder in his speech or in the transcription of it, wouldn't he have sent out a sermon to correct it shortly afterwards? In one of his sermons he said that he never preached a sermon and sent it out to be read that the people couldn't call it scripture. Wouldn't he have corrected this one in particular since it was a conference sermon? Speaking of misquotes and misinterpretations, let me draw your attention to page 16 of your book Adam, who is he, where you quoted Brigham Young, the father frequently came to visit his son Adam and talked and walked with him and the children of Adam were more or less acquainted with him. Now let me quote it the way that it is written in the Journal of Discourses, which apparently was your reference. The father frequently came to visit his son Adam and talked and walked with him, and the children of Adam were more or less acquainted with their grandfather. Brigham Young, JD 9148. Again, on page 13 of your book, you wrote, President Brigham Young also said, he nevertheless was Michael, the archangel, and not deity. However, God is a member of deity, and Brigham Young said that Adam was God, as clearly described in the following quote. Now hear it, O inhabitants of the earth, Jew, and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body, and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken he is our father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Every man upon the earth, professing Christians or non-professing, must hear it, and will know it sooner or later. JD 150. Other quotations by President Young also plainly state that he meant Adam was our God. Some may think what I have said concerning Adam strange, but the period will come when the people will be willing to adopt Joseph Smith as their prophet, seer and revelator and God, but not the father of their spirits, for that was our father Adam. Wilford Woodruff Diaries 1211, 1869. Adam and Eve are the parents of all pertaining to the flesh, and I would not say that they are not also the parents of our spirits. JD 7290. Then, since Adam, or Michael, is the father of our spirits, wouldn't that make him our God? President Young went much further in explaining what he meant when he said. Who did beget him? Christ his father, and his father is our God, and the father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Who is he? He is Father Adam, 
Michael, The Ancient of Days, Wilfred Woodruff Journal, 2 19 18 54. And again, Adam had begotten all the spirits that were to come to this earth, and Eve our common mother who is the mother of all living, bore those spirits in the celestial world. Father Adam's oldest son, Jesus the Savior, who is the heir of the family, is Father Adam's first begotten in the spirit world, who according to the flesh is the only begotten as it is written. L. John Nettles Diaries, 2 7 18 77. It seems the deity is one of the principal mysteries of all religions and ministers. But a starting point for most of them might be from the scripture that reads. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. I John 5 7. This indicates that there is a trinity in the Godhead, or a presidency among them. In your conference address, you quoted Brigham Young as saying, it is true that the earth was organized by three distinct characters, namely Elohim, Yehava, and Michael, these three forming a quorum. JD 150. Should we believe that Elohim is God the Father, Yehava is Christ, and Michael is the Holy Ghost? That must be wrong, so perhaps it is a different Godhead in the Old Testament than the one in the New Testament. But, in either case they are a Godhead. Joseph Smith said that Adam obtained a first presidency, and held the keys of the first presidency from generation to generation, and that he obtained the first presidency in the creation, before the world was formed. TPJS, page 157. What first presidency, other than that of the Godhead, could Joseph Smith be talking about? We must admit that the story of Adam's creation is not a literal account. The prophet Joseph Smith didn't believe it either, for he said, where was there ever a son without a father? And where was there ever a father without first being a son? Whenever did a tree or anything spring into existence without a progenitor? And everything comes in this way. Paul says that which is earthly is in the likeness of that which is heavenly, hence if Jesus had a father, can we not believe that he had a father also? I despise the idea of being scared to death at such a doctrine, for the Bible is full of it. TPJS, page 373. You too, apparently do not believe Moses' account of Adam's genesis, because in your conference, talk you raised this question by asking, is any child ever begotten without a father? Ensign, page 18, the Old Testament says that Adam was made like an adobe, but the New Testament traces the genealogy of Christ back to Adam, which was the son of God, Luke 3:38. either Adam was made like a brick, or he was begotten in the flesh by his father in heaven. But this also presents a problem for you. You said that God had only one begotten son in the flesh. Ensign, page 18, now then, if Adam is the son of God in the flesh, according to the New Testament, and Jesus is also his son in the flesh how, can Jesus be called the only begotten son? Perhaps Christ was the only begotten of God, while God was in his glorified state. If God became Adam, then the fall would have caused his body to be in a different condition, and not in the glorified state that it had been before. His children then would be mortal rather than immortal, and they would not be called only begotten. Then we have another contradiction from the Bible on the Son of God. In Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus, we read that Mary's son which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matt. 120. Thus if we take this scripture literally, Jesus is the Son of the Holy Ghost, and not God the Father. President Brigham Young said that if this were true, then the elders ought to be careful about laying hands on women to bestow the Holy Ghost on them, lest they too conceive a son. Who, then is the real father and grandfather of Adam? And to repeat your question, Adam, who is he? We might find the answer from Brigham Young in this conference report in 1854. How different this conference talk by Brigham Young is from your conference talk in 1980. Here is a portion of his talk on Adam. He our God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, both body and spirit, and he is the Father of our spirits, and the Father of our flesh in the beginning. You will not dispute the words of the Apostle, that he is actually the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father of our spirits. You may add these words to it, or let it alone, it is all the same to me, that he is not only the Father of our spirits, but also of our flesh, he being the founder of that natural machinery through which we have all obtained our bodies. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the Father of our spirits. I tell you more, Adam is the Father of our spirits. He had lived upon an earth, he did abide his creation, and did honor to his calling and priesthood, and obeyed his master or lord, and probably many of his wives did the same when they lived. And died upon an earth, and they were resurrected again to immortality and eternal life. Our spirits and the spirits of all the human family were begotten by Adam, and born of Eve.
but I reckon that Father Adam and Mother Eve had the children of the human family prepared to come here and take bodies, and when they come to take bodies, they enter into the bodies prepared for them, and that body gets an exaltation with the spirit. When they are prepared to be crowned in Father's kingdom. What, into Adam's kingdom? Yes. I tell you, when you see your father in the heavens, you will see Adam. When you see your mother, that bore your spirit, you will see Mother Eve. And when you see yourselves there, you have gained your exaltation, you have honored your calling here on the earth, your body has returned to its mother earth, and somebody has broken the chains of death that bound you, and given you a resurrection. Brigham Young, 24th Semi-Annual Conference, October 8, 1854. It is amazing to me how a president of the church could speak so plainly on the subject of Adam, and then in 100 years, apostles of the same church speak on that subject with such a completely different meaning. We must only conclude with the words of Elder Bruce R. McConkie, who wrote, There is no mystery about this doctrine except that which persons ignorant of the great principles of exaltation and unfriendly to the cause of righteousness have attempted to make. Mormon Doctrine, page 19. Joseph Smith's Teachings on Adam. You have quoted extensively from the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, indicating that you place some credence upon his teachings. However, you either overlooked many of his quotations on Adam or did not adequately explain their meaning. I, too, would like to quote from his teachings and ask the following questions pertaining to 20 of his statements. 1. He Adam is the father of the human family and presides over the spirits of all men. TPJS, page 157. 1. It has been taught that only God presides over the spirits of all men. What position did Adam have in the pre-existence to preside over all men? 1. If Adam presides over the spirits of all men, that would include Jesus Christ. How could Adam preside over Christ unless he was his father? 2. He Adam had dominion given him over every living creature. TPJS, page 157. 1. If Adam was given dominion over every creature, that, too, would include all men and Jesus Christ. Dominion means authority, power and the right to rule so how did Adam attain that much dominion? 3. He Adam was the first and father of all, not only by progeny, the first to hold the spiritual blessings. TPJS, page 158. 1. What right or how did Adam obtain spiritual blessings first before anyone else? 1. When he says that Adam was first to hold spiritual blessings, how could he obtain that right before Jesus Christ? 1. If Adam is the father of all not only by progeny, does this mean he is father over their spirits, too? 4. He Adam is the head and was told to multiply. TPJS, page 158. 1. This could not mean the only head over mortal beings, because Noah had the same obligation with mankind. Only God is head over Jesus, so what head is he referring to? 5. Adam holds the keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times, i.e., the dispensation of all the times have been and will be revealed through him from the beginning to Christ, and from Christ to the end of the dispensations that are to be revealed. TPJS, page 167. 1. By what right did Adam get authority and keys over every dispensation on earth? 1. Since only God has the keys and authority over the dispensation of Christ on earth, how did Adam attain the keys? 1. Since Adam presided over the first dispensation, what right did he have to hold the keys over every other dispensation including any others that ever will be? 6. The keys have to be brought from heaven whenever the gospel is sent. When they are revealed from heaven, it is by Adam's authority. TPJS, page 157. 1. How did Adam gain the right and authority over the gospel each time it is sent to earth, since only God is supposed to have authority over Christ's gospel and Christ's dispensation too? 7. It, the priesthood, is the channel through which the Almighty commenced revealing His glory at the beginning of the creation of this earth, and through which He has continued to reveal Himself to the children of men to the present time, and through which He will make known His purposes to the end of time. TPJS, page 167. 1. Does God reveal his glory through Adam's authority and priesthood, or his own? See previous statement. 8. That portion which brought Moses to speak with God face to face was taken away, but that which brought the ministry of angels remained. All the prophets had the Melchizedek priesthood and were ordained by God himself. TPJS, page 1881. 6. Does God ordain his prophets through Adam's authority? See statement number 6. 9. 
it was Adam to whom Christ was first revealed, and through whom Christ has been revealed from heaven, and will continue to be revealed from henceforth. TPJS, page 167. 1. Was it Adam who revealed the identity of the Son when John baptized Jesus? C. Matt. 317. Q. All the Bible students and scholars declare that it is God who reveals the Christ. So was it Adam who revealed Christ to Joseph Smith in the first vision? 10. All that have had the keys must stand before him Adam in this grand council. TPJS, page 157. 1. If men are only accountable to God for the keys of the priesthood, why do all who hold those keys stand before Adam? 11. The Son of Man stands before him, and there is given him glory and dominion. TPJS, page 157. 1. If Jesus holds authority over Adam, why does Jesus stand before Adam? Rather than Adam standing before Jesus? 12. Adam delivers up his stewardship to Christ, that which was delivered to him as holding the keys of the universe, but retains his standing as head of the human family. TPJS, page 157. 1. Since men attain the keys of the universe only when they are gods, how did Adam get them? 1. Why would Adam be giving the keys to Christ rather than Christ giving them to Adam? 1. Since Adam still retains his standing as head of the human family, wouldn't this mean in a spiritual sense, because mortality at this time would be finished? 2. The prophet Joseph explained that his God's wisdom is alone sufficient to govern and regulate the mighty creations and worlds. TPJS, page 55, how then did Adam hold those keys to the universe? And how did he get them before Christ did? 13. We cannot be made perfect without them, nor they without us. When these things are done, the Son of Man will descend, the Ancient of Days it. TPJS, page 159. 1. When the Son of Man is descending, the Ancient of Days is sitting. Does this mean that Adam is on the throne? 14. And the Lord appeared unto them, and they rose up and blessed Adam, and called him Michael, the Prince, the Archangel. TPJS, page 38. 1. When the Lord was in their midst, they rose up and blessed Adam, shouldn't they have blessed the Lord if he had authority over Adam? 15. The backquote H-O-R-N apostrophe made war with the saints and overcame them, until the Ancient of Days came. TPJS, page 159. 1. Why did the saints receive deliverance only when Adam came? 16. Judgment was given to the saints of the Most High from the Ancient of Days. TPJS, page 159. 1. Since judgment is a power from God, how did Adam have the right to give it to the saints? 1. If God the first, the Creator, had a dispensation of things to men on the earth, why was that first dispensation Adam's? 18. This then is the nature of the priesthood, every man holding the presidency of his dispensation, and one man holding the presidency of them all, even Adam. TPJS, page 169. 1. Why wouldn't Adam hold the presidency over just his own dispensation like everybody else, instead of holding the presidency over every other dispensation, too? 19. I spent the day instructing them in the principles and order of the priesthood, and so on to the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood, setting forth the order pertaining to the Ancient of Days, TPJS, page 237. 1. Why does the highest order of priesthood pertain to the order of the Ancient of Days instead of Jesus Christ? 20. I saw Adam in the valley of Adam on the Amen. TPJS, page 158. 1. The word Amen, being capitalized, has reference to God or deity. What does Andi mean? It appears that Joseph Smith was attempting to teach the Adam God doctrine just as Brigham Young did. From the previous 20 statements by Joseph Smith, he gave every conceivable hint that Adam was God without actually saying it. Could it be possible that Brigham Young learned this doctrine from Joseph Smith? President Young once said to Wilfred Woodruff and others that Adam is Michael the Archangel and he is the father of Jesus Christ and is our God, and Joseph taught this principle. Wilfred Woodruff Diaries, December 16, 1957. The Mystery of God. The Prophet Joseph Smith said that we can never comprehend the things of God and of heaven, but by revelation. We may spiritualize and express opinions to all eternity, but that is no authority. TPJS, page 292, thus we know that not many understand the things of God. On another occasion the prophet agreed to this by saying that there are but a few beings in the world who understand rightly the character of God. TPJS, page 343, and we may say the same about Adam.
There are many controversial doctrinal issues stemming from different sources by men trying to explain Adam. For instance, you stated in conference that, after his mortal death, he resumed his position as an angel in the heavens and took again his former name of Michael. Ensign, November 1980, page 17. Many prophets and patriarchs have had their name changed, but it was never changed back to the former name. Consider Abram who became Abraham. When Jesus spoke of him in heaven, Matt. 811, he was still known as Abraham. So, too, with Jacob who was Israel, and Saul who become Paul. It was only Michael who took again his former name. Why this difference, unless Adam was a position, a title, a special calling, or an office on earth? Why was Michael's name changed to Adam at the time he came on the earth, unless he was accomplishing a mission or official calling? It must be for this reason since the pearl of great price says, and the first man of all men, have I called Adam, which is many. Moses 1:34. since the name implies many, would it not be that it is a name that applies to men on many other earths? President Brigham Young said. Every world has had an Adam and an Eve, named so, simply because the first man is always called Adam, and the first woman Eve, Brigham Young, October 8, 1854 Conference. Hence, there are people who become an Adam and an Eve on every earth in other words, the story of creation for this earth is repeated on every other earth. The most worthy of this people will become an Adam and Eve on some new world. This was taught by Brigham Young on many occasions. When you have the privilege of commencing the work that Adam commenced on this earth, you will have all your children come and report to you of their sayings and acts, and you will hold every son and daughter of yours responsible when you get the privilege of being an Adam on earth. JD 4 271. Before me I see a house full of Eves. What a crowd of reflections the word Eve is calculated to bring up. Eve was the name or title conferred upon our first mother because she was actually to be the mother of all the human beings who should live upon this earth. I am looking upon a congregation designed to be just such beings. Mill. Star 31 267. Let me here say a word to console the feelings and hearts of all who belong to this church. Many of the sisters grieve because they are not blessed with offspring. You will see the time when you will have millions of children around you. If you are faithful to your covenants, you will be mothers of nations. You will become eaves to earths like this, and when you have assisted in peopling one earth, there are millions of earths still in the course of creation. And when they have endured a thousand million times longer than this earth, it is only as it were the beginning of your creations. JDA 208. The nature of this fall, or the mystery behind it, was also explained by President Young. Adam planted the Garden of Eden, partook of the fruit of this earth, until their systems were charged with the nature of earth and then they could beget bodies for their spiritual children. If the spirit does not enter into the embryo man that is forming in the womb of the woman, the result will be false conception. A living, intelligent being cannot be produced. October 8, 1854. If Brigham Young was wrong in his understanding of the fall of Adam, then how else could God produce mortal offspring, since the only kind he produced before were spirit children? Other statements in the scriptures lead to additional important questions. Consider a few revealed in our dispensation which say that Michael shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of heaven. D&C 88 112, how did Michael come to gain control of all the hosts of heaven? Then in this great gathering of hosts they fight a battle against the devil. And the devil shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of hell, and shall come up to battle against Michael and his armies. And then cometh the battle of the great God. D&C 88 113 4. If the devil controls the hosts of hell and God controls the hosts of heaven, why is Michael said to be in control? If this great war is called the battle of the great God, why was it Michael's battle? In another revelation to Joseph Smith, we read that all the hosts of heaven rose up and blessed Adam, D&C 10754. Nowhere in the scriptures do we read about the heavenly hosts rising up to bless Noah, Moses or Joseph Smith. Why do they bless and praise Adam instead of God? You quoted the scripture, where Michael shall sound his trump, and then shall all the dead awake for their grave shall be opened, and they shall come forth. D&C 2926. How is it that the blood of Jesus broke the bands of death, but Michael had authority to herald the resurrection? In vision Daniel, the prophet, witnessed a most magnificent drama taking place in heaven. The splendor of this enactment is glorious as the ancient of days presence to Jesus Christ in eternal kingdom. The prophet Daniel describes this scene as the Son of Man is presenting himself before the Ancient of Days to receive the power and right of dominion over this kingdom. 
While this drama unfolds, a thousand times ten thousand souls minister to the Ancient of Days, whom the prophet Daniel described by saying, The Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame. Dan. 7 9. The wisest Bible scholars recognize this description of Michael, the Ancient of Days, as none other than God. Joseph Smith also said that Adam was the Ancient of Days. Why is the God that Daniel saw? and call the Ancient of Days, so difficult for the Latter-day Saints to understand, when it was verified by both Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Pearls are not for swine. Jesus said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Matt. 7 6. The appellation of dog in the scriptures, was a term often used to denote viciousness or meanness, like that of a mad dog enemies, persecutors and those held in reproach, were often called dogs. Swine were unclean, forbidden animals among the Israelites, so they were used to describe Gentiles or unbaptized and unbelieving people. To throw pearls, or sacred principles, to swine would be foolish. Swine and dogs would trample them into the dirt and turn again without understanding or appreciation. Brigham Young, when speaking of Adam in his conference talk of October 8, 1854, said, these are things that scarcely belong to the best of this congregation. There are items of doctrine and principles in the bosom of eternity that the best of the Latter-day Saints are unworthy to receive. This is the reason that Moses wrote the story of Adam coming from the dust and Eve from his rib. The truth was a mystery because so many of the children of Israel were unable to grasp the real meaning. Brigham continues. Now about the rib. As for the Lord taking a rib out of Adam's side to make a woman of, he took one out of my side just as much. But, Brother Brigham, would you make it appear that Moses did not tell the truth? No, not a particle more than I would, that your mother did not tell the truth, when she told you that little Billy came from a hollow toadstool. I would not accuse your mother of lying, any more than I would Moses. The people in the days of Moses wanted to know things that was, sick, not for them, the same as your children do when they want to know where their little brother came from, and he answered them according to their folly, the same as you did your children. I wish you to understand well the position I have taken, and the nature of the remarks I have made. Profit by them, both saints and sinners. You have had things laid before you that do not belong to the world, nor to men and women, who calculate to apostatize. They belong to the wise, to those who are serving God with all their hearts. October 8, 1854. Doctrine of the Priesthood 2-1. On many other occasions, President Young explained the difficulty he experienced in revealing new truths, hidden mysteries, or the pearls of the gospel. I will say, as I have before said, if guilt before my God and my brethren rests upon me in the least, it is in this one thing, that I have revealed too much concerning God and his kingdom, and the designs of our Father in heaven. If my skirts are stained in the least with wrong, it is because I have been too free in telling what God is, how he lives, the nature of his providences and designs in creating the world, in bringing forth the human family on the earth, his designs concerning them, etc. If I had, like Paul, said, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant, perhaps it would have been better for the people. Day. News, June 27, 1860, page 129. Some years ago I advanced a doctrine with regard to Adam, being our father and God, that will be a curse to many of the elders of Israel, because of their folly. With regard to it, they yet grovel in darkness at will. It is one of the most glorious revealments of the economy of heaven, yet the world hold it in derision. JDA 208. But it was not only the world that held the Adam-God doctrine in derision, but one of Brigham Young's own apostles couldn't comprehend it. For many years, Orson Pratt disputed certain points in that doctrine, and others noted this controversy between the two men. Wilford Woodruff noted in his journal that President Young told Pratt that Adam came from another world and brought Eve with him, partook of the fruits of the earth, begat children, and they were earthly and had mortal bodies, and if we are faithful, we should become gods as Adam was. The president told Pratt to put aside his philosophical reasoning and get revelation from God to govern and enlighten his mind more said as Pratt's philosophy injured him in a measure. W. Woodruff Journal, September 17, 1854. Many other Mormons could not accept this doctrine on the Godhead, and of course the Protestant and Catholic denominations couldn't either. Is this not one of the pearls of the gospel that had been tossed to them, and they rendered it into the dust? As learned and scholarly as so many people are, it is evident that they cannot comprehend what President Young was teaching them. 
He further said, there are men upon whom God has bestowed gifts and graces, and women who are endowed with strong mental ability, and yet they cannot receive the truth, and then the truth condemns them, it leaves them in darkness. Day. News, June 27, 1860. In view of the history of this doctrine, it is amazing to note the difference of opinion that has existed and still persists. I thought you made a most amusing statement at the close of your conference address when you said, if any of you have been confused by false teachers who come among us, if you have been assailed by advocates of erroneous doctrines, counsel with your priesthood leaders. They will not lead you astray, but will direct you into paths of truth and salvation. Ensign, November 1980, page 18. I have personally spent 24 years in counsel with my priesthood leaders in many different states and stakes concerning this doctrine. In every instance there has been a difference of opinion and a division of thought among themselves. From the time of the announcement in 1852 of both the Adam-God doctrine and polygamy, there has been a diversity of opinions regarding these important doctrines. This division existed from the apostleship down to the deacons and continues to the present time. Perhaps people who read these statements of Brigham Young and Joseph Smith should take the counsel that was given by Joseph Smith in the inspired translation of the Bible, which says, And the mysteries of the kingdom ye shall keep within yourselves, for it is not meet to give that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls unto swine, lest they trample them under their feet. For the world cannot receive that which ye, yourselves, are not able to bear, wherefore ye shall not give your pearls unto them, lest they turn again and rend you. Say unto them, Ask of God, ask, and it shall be given you, seek, and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matt. Insp. Verse. 7 10 12. Conclusion. The basis of your conference talk was that Adam was an angel, and therefore could not be God. You said, backquote, A D A M was not our God, nor was he our Savior. But he was the humble servant of both in his status as an angel. First, the definition of angel should be established. The Bible describes many kinds of angels good, evil, heavenly, spiritual and mortal. The term angel in the New Testament comes from the Greek word angelos, meaning messenger. From the Hebrew used in the Old Testament, the corresponding word malak likewise means messenger. Some Bible scholars, such as Henry Halley, designate the word angel to also mean personage. This is not difficult for us to understand, for even Joseph Smith on occasion described the father and son as being angels, or personages. In one of his early accounts of the first vision, he wrote. I received my first visitation of angels when I was about 14 years old. Day. News, May 29, 1852, and then when Joseph wrote to the editor of the Chicago Democrat, later becoming the famous Wentworth letter from which were drawn the articles of faith, he said. I retired to a secret place in a grove and began to call upon the Lord, while fervently engaged in supplication, my mind was taken away from the objects with which I was surrounded, and I was enwrapped in a heavenly vision and saw two glorious personages who exactly resembled each other in features and likeness. DHC 4536. Hence, many prophets who have communed with God or Christ do not always choose to say they saw God, but rather only say they saw personages messengers or angels, even though they had seen and talked with God. But there is another very important key to understanding this subject of angels in Old Testament writings. The King James translators have made a slight variation in translating verses that deal with the angel of the Lord. In the original Hebrew, there are no words for of the, so the literal translation would be angel Jehovah or messenger Jehovah or personage Jehovah. Let's take a few examples to see how angel of the Lord and the personage of Jehovah can really be one and the same. 1. Jacob wrote, and the angel of God spake unto me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here am I. And he said, lift up now thine eyes, and see, all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ringstricked, speckled, and grisled, for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowedst a vow unto me. Gen. 31:11-13. 1. When Moses went up to the mountain of Horeb, it is written that. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Moreover he said the angel, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. X. 3 2, 6. C. When the Israelites were in bondage to the Midianites, they sought for a deliverer, which was to be Gideon. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and saith unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. 
And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel. Judges 6 12-14. 1. Gideon saw an angel of the Lord and said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and called it Jehovah Shalom, Judges 6 22-24. 1. When the Israelites were in bondage to the Philistines for forty years, God made known that he would send them a deliverer who would be known as Samson. The angel of the Lord made appearances to Mano and his wife promising them that they would bear a son, and how he should eat no unclean thing, neither drink strong drink, nor cut his hair. Then it says but the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Mano and his wife. Then Mano knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Mano said unto his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. Judges 13 21-32. There are numerous such infusions of the term angel of the Lord with the voice or personage of God throughout the Old Testament. This peculiar facet of scripture has been noticed by nearly all Bible scholars. Note how specifically they infer that the angel of God and God are identical. From Zondervan's Encyclopedia of the Bible. The question of identity of the angel of God has arouses an intriguing interest in Bible students. The view in which most concur is that he is a distinct personal self-manifestation of God, who may be called the incarnate logos. The reference in Judges 2-1 shows clearly that the angel of the Lord is God in his self-manifestation. This is also the case with similar patriarchal passages dealing with Abraham, Jacob, and Moses. For instance, he was not restricted to executing a single order, but, like Jesus, he spoke with authority, as though he were God himself. Only the Logos, or some other manifest personification of God, would be able to do that. John declared that the Logos was in the beginning with God, and that he was God, that he was instrumental in the creation, and that the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 1 14, Zondervan's Bowl.1 162 3. How interesting to note that the angel of God mentioned so often in the Old Testament was often none other than the God of Israel Jehovah. And let me include one more very important item concerning angels from President Brigham Young. He said, I believe we have already acknowledged the truth established that no person can officiate in any office he has not been subject to himself and been legally appointed to fill. That no person in this kingdom can officiate in any ordinance he himself has not obeyed, consequently no being who has not been resurrected possesses the keys of the power of resurrection. That you have been told often. Adam therefore was resurrected by someone who had been resurrected. I will go a little further with this lest some of you will be querying, doubting, and philosophizing this away. It is true, Jesus said, I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. I do not doubt the power of Christ, but did he prove that in his resurrection? No. But it is proved that an angel came and rolled away the stone from the door of the sepulchre, and did resurrect the body of the Son of God. 24th Semi-Annual Conference, October 8, 1854. Who was the angel that came to the Son of God and gave the keys of power for his resurrection? Who but God, his Father, was resurrected at that time? According to your conference talk, you directly stated that it is Adam, or Michael, who is in charge of heralding the resurrection of the dead, and, what a marvelous calling for Adam or Michael. I must agree that Adam, or Michael, heralded the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If God, as Michael or Adam, was really the first being on earth, how disappointing it will be for the masses of humanity to discover that they really did not know the true God. How embarrassing it will be for so many ministers of religion who have taught that Adam began as nothing more than an adobe brick or that he has become nothing more than a messenger of God. The importance of knowing the true God is best described by Jesus who said, This is life eternal to know thee the only true God. Sincerely. Ogden Kraut. O.K. Abel. C.C. Elder Bruce R. McConkie. P.S. In D&C 129 1-3 it states that there are two kinds of beings in heaven. L. Angels, who are resurrected personages, having bodies of flesh and bones and, two Spirits of just men made perfect. Could you please tell me in which category God falls? A. Response. To the. Ex Mormons. For Jesus. By Ogden Kraut. LDS Anonymous. Ex Mormons for Jesus. 
Gentlemen, having just read your little pamphlet entitled, Mormonism, Christian or Cult, I would very much like to express my sentiments regarding your denunciations. You said that the backquote G-O-D apostrophe and backquote J-E-S-U-S -S apostrophe of Mormonism will not save you, but you indicated that the Jesus that you serve will save us. I am constantly amazed at all the different Jesuses there are all contending against each other, all claiming to be the real Jesus. There is the sabbatical Jesus of the Adventists, the Jehovah Jesus of the Witnesses, the ritualistic Jesus of the Catholics, the liberal Jesus of the Unitarians, the Baptist and Pentecostal Jesus, and now we have the anti-Mormon Jesus. What a babbling and contending assortment of weird ideas these modern Christian ministers have brewed up. They all preach about heaven and hell, God and the devil, yet they haven't seen any of them. But I guess it doesn't matter they need only a $10 Bible to set up business anyway. Nevertheless, we were warned nearly 2,000 years ago by the Savior himself when he said many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Matt. 24 5, then he concluded by adding, if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or, there, believe it not. Matt. 24 23, most of the time I don't and in your case I won't make any exception. You have written little pro and con inserts in your letter, and for the remainder of my letter, I would like to respond to these. I would like to mention before proceeding, however, that at times you have quoted from various contemporary LDS church leaders, as if they were absolute authorities on church doctrine. It is important to keep in mind that they often voice their opinions, which cannot be accepted as official Mormon doctrine. Mormonism says all other church is false. I was answered that I must join none of them for they were all wrong, and the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, and those professors were all corrupt. Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith 219. This church is the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. Doctrine and Covenants 130 There is no salvation outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Bruce R. McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, page 670. All other churches are entirely destitute of all authority from God, and any person who receives baptism or the Lord's Supper from their hands will highly offend God, for he looks upon them as the most corrupt of all people. Both Catholics and Protestants are nothing less than the whore of Babylon. Orson Pratt, The Seer, page 255. The Bible. The church is the spiritual body of Christian believers with Jesus at its head. That is the true church not an organization. Ephesians 1 22-23, 4 11-16, 1 Corinthians 1 2, 12 12, Matthew 16 18. It is evident from the words of Christ that many would come in his name and deceive many, and if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Matt. 24 24, these are usually the ministers who draw near with their mouths, but their hearts are far from him. Yet, they continue to exist and even thrive. The prophet Joseph Smith explained, I cannot believe in any of the creeds of the different denominations because they all have some things in them I cannot subscribe to, though all of them have some truth. TPJS, page 327, it is their doctrinal errors that make them wrong. For example, Jesus told his disciples that they should go forth teaching the gospel and carry neither purse nor script, Luke 10 4, which they did. Paul also traveled the same way and said, I have preached to you the gospel of God freely, 2 Cor. 11 7. But today the ministers have multi-million dollar purses to help them in preaching the gospel. Over a thousand different Christian churches all contend that they are right, but it is possible for only one to be right and the rest wrong, or else they are all wrong. What Joseph Smith said of himself. I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. Joseph Smith, History of the Church, Bowl. 6, page 408, 409. The Bible, no prophet of God ever spoke like that. Yet the Mormon people are trusting their eternal salvation in a system set up by him. See Daniel 4 28-33. King Nebuchadnezzar had such pride and was driven out to live with the animals by God. Just one month after delivering the above-quoted speech, Joseph Smith was killed by a mob, but only after he had shot and killed two of the mob himself. History of the Church, Bowl. 7, pages 102, 103.
You have indicated that no prophet ever spoke as Joseph Smith did about his own accomplishments. Did you forget about Moses boasting so much over his bringing water from the rock, see Num. 2010, that the Lord forbid him to enter the promised land? Paul himself said that I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, 2 Cor. 11.5, and also that he had labored more abundantly than all the apostles, I Cor. 15.10. When Joseph Smith said that the followers of Jesus ran away from him, he was referring to the disciples becoming offended in him and thus leaving him. Even Peter denied knowing him, see Matt. 26 31 to 35, all of which was the fulfillment of an ancient Old Testament prophecy, Zech. 13 7, that these disciples would be offended and flee from him. It is not difficult to believe that Joseph Smith was correct when he said, no man ever did such a work as I. He established a church that has successfully withstood the greatest political and religious outrages for over 150 years. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is one of the most dominant churches in the world with 5 million members. He published a book that is second only to the Bible in number of publications. Mormon leaders view of themselves. When our leaders speak, the thinking has been done. When they point the way, there is no other which is safe. When they give direction, it should mark the end of controversy. Improvement Era, Official Church Magazine, June 1945, page 345. The living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works, Bible, Book of Mormon, Ek. The living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet, David, Moses, Isaiah, etc. Those who would remove prophets from politics would take God out of government. Ezra Taft Benson, next in line to be prophet, address at Brigham Young University, February 26, 1980. The Bible, in these last days God speaks through his son, Hebrews 1 1 2. The authority claimed by the Mormon Church is through an Aaronic priesthood, which cannot be valid since Jesus abolished it, as he took its place, Hebrews 7 11 19, 8 6 13, and a Melchizedek priesthood which never existed as any priesthood. Jesus is our high priest in the likeness of M E L C H I Z E D E K Addy holds this permanently, and no one else. Hebrews 7 15 28, 9 11 15. It is not difficult to understand why the ministers of today say there is no priesthood they are admitting that they don't have it. If they do not possess it, then it is reasonable that they also don't understand it. At least you fellows admit the truth by saying that Jesus held it but you don't. In ancient Israel men received a holy anointing. This was administered to those who would hold a priestly office, as did Aaron. This was a priesthood which shall surely be an everlasting priesthood, and that it would be a priesthood throughout their generations, x. 4015. Furthermore, this priesthood was to follow in certain lineages, such as with Phineas, son of Aaron, who shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, Num. 2513. It would be foolish in the extreme to suppose that the seed of all these men had suddenly stopped when Christ was born, or that no one else would be worthy of it, because there were none who were, or ever would be zealous for God. You say that in these last days God speaks through his Son. Who are those who have received God's word in these last days, if it isn't prophets just as God has always delivered his messages? Have you fellows turned prophets or revelators? Or are you going around with just a Bible like all the other ministers who claim God's words is with you alone? Surely no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron, Heb. 5-4. Although they did not require the offering up of animal sacrifices after the sacrifice of Christ, they were still required to have an holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices, I Peter 2 5. Furthermore, Peter testified that they were of that special lineage by saying ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, I Peter 2 9. Surely the priesthood could not be found among all the hostile Christian campaigners, for it would be an offense to God. Mormonism denies virgin birth. Christ was begotten by an immortal father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers Christ was born into the world, as the literal son of this holy being he was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. Bruce R. McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, page 742. The Bible. Jesus was begotten by the Holy Ghost. Mary was indeed a virgin. Matthew 1 18 to 23, Luke 1 35. Mormons do not deny that Mary was a virgin. Quite a few women get married today who are virgins, and when they conceive a child, it is begotten of a father. 
If all the Protestant ministers claim that Jesus was begotten by the Holy Ghost, then they should cease calling him the Son of God because he would be the Son of the Holy Ghost. We read that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Luke 1 15, also Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Matt. 1 18, the difference between these two was that the power of the highest overshadowed Mary. Then the sentence continues to say that Jesus would be known as the Son of God. Luke 1 35. The scriptures continually call him the Son of God, but never the Son of the Holy Ghost. For instance, God is called the Father and Jesus is the Son, see John 8 38, 17 11. Christ is born of God, I John 5 1. Jesus is the only begotten Son, Matt. 14 33, Mark 1 1, John 3 16. And Jesus admitted, I am the Son of God, Matt. 27 43. One of the reasons that Jesus was crucified is because he made the claim to be the Son of God. John 19 7. It is all too evident that if Jesus were begotten of the Holy Ghost, then all ministers should refrain from allowing any women to have the Holy Ghost, lest she too become pregnant and thereby conceive another only begotten Son of God. The authority of the Bible denied. Ignorant translators, careless transcribers, or designing and corrupt priests have committed many errors many plain and precious things were deleted, in consequence of which error and falsehood poured into the various churches. One of the great heresies of modern Christendom is the unfounded assumption that the Bible contains all of the inspired teachings now extant among men. Bruce R. McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, pages 82-83. The Bible, the Bible says of itself that G-O-D at S word therein will stand forever, Isaiah 48, I Peter 1 25, ask the Mormon to show you exactly where the errors exist. Since most of the doctrines added by Mormonism are not in the Book of Mormon either, which is claimed to contain the fullness of the everlasting gospel, the plain and precious things did not make it in there either. If you fellows are not aware of any errors in the Bible, it is evident that you have never read it carefully. There is a train of errors that could be mentioned, but it is certainly not worth the time or effort to list them here. However, in response to your request, a few examples are. Reporting errors. The crucifixion was the most important event in the history of the world. Four disciples of Christ were supposed to have been witnesses or at least to have correctly reported that event. However, they each reported a different inscription on the cross. Matthew. This is Jesus the King of the Jews. 2737. Mark, the King of the Jews. 1526. Luke. This is the King of the Jews. 2338. John, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 1919. Contradictional errors. No man hath seen God at any time. I John 412. Jacob said, I have seen God face to face. Gen. 3230. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham. Gen. 181 and Noah walked with God. Gen. 6 9. The Lord spoke unto Moses, face to face. X. 33 11. And I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. Amos 9 1. I saw the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Act 7 56. Quoting errors. And it repented the Lord that he had made man. Gen. 6 6. God is not a man, that he should lie, neither the Son of, that he should repent. Num. 2319. Mistaken identity errors. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Gen. 1 1. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Heb. 1 2. English errors. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Gen. 3 8. If anyone is really interested in locating all the errors in the Bible, there are books written on the subject. There is a popular paperback edition being sold for $4.95 called Discrepancies in the Bible that you should read if you are still not convinced that there are biblical errors. There are over 1,000 Christian churches in the United States alone, all with the same Bible, but all claiming the others are wrong, and they are right. This is a clear manifestation that either the Bible is incomplete and contains errors, or that the ministers are all in error. However, it is probably both. Some claim that we must be baptized under the water, others by sprinkling or by pouring, and some believe only in baptism of the Spirit. Yet, some contend that we need no baptism at all that Jesus did it for us. Such confusions exist with every other principle and ordinance, also. Even the translators have trouble.
they have been tirelessly trying to get an error-proof Bible for many centuries, with new ones being published constantly. We now have over 450 different Bibles to choose from they are either to correct errors of previous editions or to convince others of their personal beliefs. Out of all this confusion, contention, and corruption, it is no wonder that God sent a prophet like Joseph Smith to help people understand the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Mrs. God? In that heaven where our spirits were born there are many gods, each of whom has his own wife or wives, which were given to him previous to his redemption, while yet in his mortal state. Orson Pratt, Apostle, The Seer, page 37. This doctrine that there is a mother in heaven was affirmed in all plainness by the First Presidency of the Church. Bruce R. McConkie, Apostle, Mormon Doctrine, page 516. Bible. Absolutely no mention of any wives of God. Matthew 22 29, 30. You have asked the question about Mrs. God, but the Bible doesn't say anything about Mr. God either. Your terminology is quite clever, but it should apply to other conditions, too. If you think that Jesus was begotten by the Holy Ghost, then Mary should have been called Mrs. Holy Ghost. We don't see anywhere in the Bible that Eve became Mrs. Adam either. The principle to be considered in marriage is that which was introduced with marriage itself and has continued throughout all nations ever since, the woman's desire and life would be in subjection to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee, Gen. 3.16, and that she would become one flesh with him. She would not have a separate identity as before, and she would take upon herself his name. Look in your local phone book and notice that for married couples, they have listed only the man's name there. Or do you believe that all those men are unmarried, too? We were all born as spirits to our father and mother in heaven before we came here, as Paul taught by saying we are the offspring of God, Acts 17 29, and the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Rom. 8 16, he continued by explaining, Furthermore we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits, and live? Heb. 12 9, even the ancient prophet knew this, as Jeremiah was told by the Lord, Before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jer. 1 5. Neither can we omit such a clear passage as, God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Gen. 1 26, And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Gen. 127. If you do not believe that we are the children of our Father in heaven, then cease to pray as Jesus told us to by saying, Our Father in heaven. Matt. 6 9. Mormonism's God is limited. The universe is filled with vast numbers of intelligences, and we further learn that Elohim is God, simply because all of these intelligences honor and sustain him as such if he should ever do anything to violate the confidence or sense of justice of these intelligences, they would promptly withdraw their support, and the power of God would disintegrate he would cease to be God. W. Kleen Skousen, BYU professor and founder of Mormon-based Freeman Institute, the first 2,000 years, page 355. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's doctrine and covenants, 130-22. If God possesses a form, that form is of necessity of definite proportions and therefore of limited extension in space it is impossible for him to occupy at one time more than one space of such limits. James E. Tomage, Articles of Faith, page 43. The Bible, God is infinite. Any other God is a false God. 2 Chronicles 6 18, Psalm 139 4-8, Jeremiah 23 24. You claim that God is infinite. By this it is presumed that you also believe he is in all things, through all things, everywhere present in no place in particular. Many ministers say their God is infinite, and therefore he is immaterial, whose center is everywhere, and whose circumference is nowhere. This philosophical absurdity portends a God that has no dimension, no figure, no personage, and therefore he must be extremely difficult to find. A God who has no ears to hear, nor eyes to see, and who has no parts or passions, would be a sorry God to pray to and expect some kind of answer. No wonder the Protestants and Catholics haven't heard anything from him for nearly 2,000 years. These preachers testify of a God who has no dimensions or substance but that is a description of nothing. I have always suspected that the Protestants weren't worshipping anything, but now they confirm it. Ancient heathens worshipped gods of stone and wood but at least they existed. 
these modern apostate ministers want us to worship nothing. Here we have a most unusual situation two kinds of atheists. One class denies the existence of God at all, but the others deny his existence in duration, space and form. One says, there is no gods, but the other says, God is not here or there. The infidel says, God does not exist anywhere, but the immaterialist says, he exists nowhere. The infidel says, there is no such substance as God, and the immaterialists say, there is no substance in God. One atheist believes that there is nothing to God, and the other believes that God is nothing. If there is anything in the doctrines of the Catholics and Protestants that would prevent me from joining them, it would be the idea that I had to pray to a God that had no existence. It would also completely discourage me from trying to become like him. You say that you are in the ministry to save the Mormons. I would suggest that you save your prayers and save your missionary labors in fact, try to save yourselves. Pray for yourself, labor with yourself, and get away from becoming one in likeness to that God for it would mean annihilation. Mormonism's God was once a man. God himself was once as we are now, and as an exalted man I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth. Joseph Smith, History of the Church, Bowl. 6, page 305. The Bible. God was never a man. He created man. God has been God from all eternity to all eternity. Psalm 41 13, 92, 102 25 to 27, Romans 1 22 to 23. The ministers of modern Christianity who believe that God is nowhere, everywhere, in everything, without form or substance, would naturally not believe that God was once a man. It is impossible for nothing to have once been something. It takes a real prophet to clarify such stupid traditions and philosophies. Let me quote the prophet Joseph Smith, it is the first principle of the gospel, to know for a certainty the character of God, and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another, and that he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth, the same as Jesus Christ himself did, and I will show it from the Bible. The scriptures inform us that Jesus said, as the father hath power in himself, even so hath the son power to do what? Why, what the father did? The answer is obvious in a manner, to lay down his body, and take it up again. Jesus, what are you going to do? To lay down my life as my father did, and take it up again? Do we believe it? If you do not believe it, you do not believe the Bible. Here, then, is eternal life to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely, by going from one small degree to another, and from a small capacity to a great one. Dot dot dot. My father worked out his kingdom with fear and trembling, and I must do the same, and when I get my kingdom, I shall present it to my father, so that he may obtain kingdom upon kingdom, and it will exalt him in glory. He will then take a higher exaltation, and I will take his place, and thereby become exalted myself. So that Jesus treads in the tracks of his father, and inherits what God did before, and God is thus glorified and exalted in the salvation and exaltation of all his children. It is plain beyond disputation, and you thus learn some of the first principles of the gospel, about which so much hath been said. TPJS, see pages 345 to 48. A young boy grows up to become a man like his father. When Jesus told his disciples to go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, John 20 17, he was not speaking in generalities. There is no son without a father, and the scriptures clearly support this doctrine. It is the ancient Greek and Roman philosophies that crept into Catholicism and changed the pure doctrines of Christ into this ethereal and mystical hogwash, which has continued to be preached by the apostates from Catholicism. All the Protestants are apostates from Catholicism, and they brought many of these heathen philosophies of men with them and continue to call it the gospel of Christ. Mormonism's Jesus was married. Jesus was the bridegroom at the marriage at Cana of Galilee. We say it was Jesus Christ who was married, to be brought into relation whereby he could see his seed. Orson Hyde, Apostle, Journal of Discourses, Bowl. 2. Page 82. The Bible, no. Check out John 2 1-12. This doctrine generally is not taught today. However, since marriage in a Mormon temple is mandatory to progress to become a god in Mormonism, to fit the theology of Mormonism the Mormon Jesus had to be married. 
Otherwise, he would only be a ministering servant to those in Mormonism's heaven who have celestial marriage. God said it was not good for man to be alone, and so man and women were created in the image and likeness of God, and they were to be one flesh. That described the condition of God and man. The law and commandment to be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, Gen. 128, was never revoked or changed. Even Paul the Apostle confirmed this by saying neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. I Cor. 1111, furthermore, the women is the glory of the man. I Cor. 117. It was a Gnostic philosophy that crept into Christianity teaching them that celibacy is more holy than matrimony. Any student of Catholicism can soon discover the gradual changes that crept into the Catholic faith with regard to this pagan philosophy. When the Protestants rejected the Mother Church, they took with them all those traditions and false doctrines concerning marriage. Paul prophesied that this would happen and said that some people would give heed to these doctrines of devils by forbidding to marry. C.I. Tim. 4 1 3. From the ages of 12 to 30, a gap of 18 years, the scriptural history of the life of Christ is missing. This is the very time when men usually marry. John the Beloved said all the things that Jesus did would be enough to fill libraries, so we can conclude the reason why there is so little said about the marriage of Jesus. If we had the missing books of the New Testament, which we know were written, it might give us much more light upon this history. Some of these lost books are. An earlier epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, I Cor. 5-9. Another epistle of Paul to the Ephesians, F. 3-3. An epistle of Paul from Laodicea, Colonel 4-16. A former epistle of Jude, Jude 1 3. The prophecies of Enoch, Jude 1 14. All through the New Testament, Jesus was called Rabbi. He was so called by Peter, Mark 9 5, by the other disciples, John 1 38, 4 31, 9 2, and even Nicodemus, a Pharisee and ruler of the Jews, also called him a rabbi. John 3 2. Now then, a rabbi was a teacher by precept and by example. If Jesus had been a celibate teacher of the law, then all of his accusers would have had their greatest reason to denounce him. He would not be fulfilling the commandments and laws of God concerning marriage. This law is still in vogue among the Hebrew people, every Jewish man should marry at 18, and he who marries earlier is more meritorious. The Shalchan Aruch, Ibn Hezer 1 3. Since the Mishnah fixes the 18th year of one's life as the age of marriage, a man unmarried after this time is, in many communities, regarded as not having conformed with inviolable tradition. Jewish Ceremonies and Customs, William Rosenau, page 155. Both ancient and modern scholars of the Bible admit that all of the apostles were married men. It is an admitted fact that the Old Testament law required that a man should be 30 years of age and married in order to become a priest. This is why Jesus did not get baptized, anointed, nor begin his ministry until he was 30 years old. In the Greek text of the New Testament there is no difference in the word why for woman, and the scriptures inform us that Jesus was often with a woman. The Protestant minister, Dr. Phipps, admitted that master was a common term for husband. Dot 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 words such as those used by Martha when she said to Mary, her sister. The master is come and call it for thee. John 11:28. Master was the title that a wife used when speaking of her husband. Was Jesus married? Page 17. Some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are now being uncovered and are revealing that Jesus was married. The Gospel of Thomas, page 57, and the Gospel of Philip, page 35, show more evidence for this fact. You said to check out John 2 1 12, which is the account of the marriage at Cana. In my book Jesus was married, chapter 5 deals with the Jewish customs and traditions showing that this would have to have been Christ's marriage. This subject could be extended considerably, but it is only too reasonable that Jesus never omitted the fulfillment of any of the laws of God. He could not obey some, neglect others, and then say to all mankind, follow me. If you fellows believe that Jesus was celibate, then you should not only teach everyone to be like him and not marry, but also refuse to have anything to do with marriage yourself. Do you suppose that Jesus was too holy to be married? Or was the law of marriage too unholy for Jesus? If so, then God should never have given man such a law when he created him. Neither should Jesus have participated in the marriage at Cana, nor endorsed anyone including his apostles to have a wife. Such thinking and deductions are preposterous. But that is what you ministers of modern Christianity are trying to sustain as true doctrine. In Mormonism there are many gods. In the beginning, the head of the gods called the council of the gods and they came together 
and concocted a plan to create the world and people it in all congregations, when I have preached on the subject of the deity, it has been the plurality of gods. Joseph Smith, founder and first prophet, history of the church, vol. 6, pages 308 and 474. The Bible. There was and is and always will be only one God. Isaiah 43 10-11, 44 6-8, 45 5-6, 18-22, Deuteronomy 6 4, 32 39. James 2 19. You say that there was and is and always will be only one God, but Paul clearly explained, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, and lords many, but to us there is but one God. I Cor. 8 5 6. There was certainly more than one member of the Godhead in the creation, for it is written that God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Gen. 126, John agreed by saying, there are three, that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I John 5 7. Now there exists a perfect confusion among the Catholics and Protestants about these three being one. But three cannot be one, because if they were one, they would no longer be three. But they are one in purpose. Jesus is separate from his Father, because he admitted, that my Father is greater than I. John 14:28 and a little later he told Mary, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. John 20 17, we also note that, when Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, that it was his will, to let the bitter cup pass, but the will of the Father was otherwise. He asked, thy will not mine be done. But most graphically we have a better illustration of three distinct personages at the baptism of Jesus, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matt. 3 16-17. Here was, 1, Jesus being baptized, 2, God speaking from heaven, and, 3, the Holy Spirit descending. Also we are told in the scriptures, that the devil is the god of this world's. 2 Cor. 4 4, and even Moses became a god. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. X. 7 1. This brings us up to the next item for discussion. Mormonism says man may become God. Here then is eternal life to know the only wise and true God. And you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to God the same as all gods have done before you to inherit the same power, the same glory and the same exaltation, until you arrive at the station of God. Joseph Smith History of the Church Vol. 6. P. 306. The Bible, the sin of Satan from the beginning, was that many may become a god. Genesis 3 1-5, Isaiah 14 12-15, Ezekiel 28 1-10. Some of you ministers think that heaven is where you will spend eternity staring at the face of Jesus, but most ministers really don't know what they will be doing. A Mormon will tell you that he expects to continue growing in wisdom and knowledge forever. I prefer the latter to anything I have ever heard from any other religion, especially some of the Protestants. Paul tells us that we belong to the whole family in heaven. F. 4.15, and Peter tells us that we can be heirs together of the grace of life, I Peter 3.7, and thus prepare for ourselves a little family kingdom. Paul also testifies that we are the children of God and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Rom. 8.16-17, God himself testified, that he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Rev. 21 7, John also added, that we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Dot dot dot, I John 3 2. Jesus gave us something to consider in our eternal destiny when he said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Matt. 548, it will be a long long time, before we can become as perfect as our Father in heaven, is yet Jesus was saying, that it could be done, or he wouldn't have given us that commandment. Furthermore, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? John 10 34, which was also written by David. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Psalms 83 6. One of the last prayers of Jesus was that we might become one even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. John 17 22-23, to become one with him, 
and joint heirs with him, would make us gods with him. One of the most important things to be revealed to man was clearly illustrated in the creation of man, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Gen. 3 5. This was verified by God himself who said, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. Gen. 3.22. Man was meant to have the experience of this life, to draw him closer to God in every respect it was a life that could bring him God ward, or to become a God himself. This was told to Moses, Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God ward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt shew them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. X. 18 19 to 20. This was repeated by Paul who said that such trust have we through Christ to God ward, 2 Cor. 3 4, and that we must add faith to God ward, I this. 1 8. This doctrine of becoming a God is not as opposed as it once was. Even Protestant ministers are beginning to see the God family, where some of the sons of the Father grow to become like their father, thus becoming gods over their own children. For instance, the Honorable Herbert W. Armstrong has said in support of this principle, God embarked on his greatest undertaking. He began the process of reproducing himself by creating man and woman out of dust from the ground. Yet, although God formed man of the dust of the ground physical matter God has given man a far greater potentiality than angels. In man, God is reproducing himself. Man has the potentiality of becoming God. Man shall when his spiritual creation is completed, judge angels, I core. 6-3. Few indeed have ever really grasped the marvelous breathtaking potential of man. By the very fact that God, through man, is reproducing himself, we know man, when his spiritual creation is completed, shall actually become God. Only God the Father will always remain supreme in authority and command, and Christ second in command, above all else. Everywhere we look we can see each animal, bird, microbe and plant reproducing itself. In Genesis 1:26, God, Elohim, is quoted as saying. Dot 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 let us make man in our image. Dot 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 God is reproducing himself. How very plain that should be to us rational thinking individuals. We humans are to be made in the very image of God. We are to become gods ourselves. Dot 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 man's ultimate destiny is to become a part of the God family. Notice John's first letter once again, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, when he, Christ, shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. I John 3 2, KJV. Can you grasp what John is saying here? Even as God became man, so man may become God. The two planes are interchangeable under certain conditions. Man is to become just as much God as Christ is God. That in a nutshell is the transcendent purpose of human life, the God family, Herbert W. Armstrong, page 8. We also note that it is written that John looked, and, lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Rev. 14 1. Thus, out of all the people on the earth there will be one hundred forty four thousand who will have the name of God written on their foreheads, because they became like their father in heaven a God. If you are a Mormon, some of the above quotations may not sound like the Mormon church you know and love. The church is filled with beautiful and sincere people. We know, because we were there. We love you and care for your eternal destiny but must stand against the system that teaches such doctrine. If you add up the years we have spent in the church, there would be thousands. We cry out to you, the God and Jesus of Mormonism will not save you. We did not leave the church to simply join another organization. We left after realizing that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. The real Jesus who died for you personally said in Revelation 3.20 that if you open the door of your heart, he will come in. The Mormon church has a percentage growth that is impressive. Ex-Mormons for Jesus is growing far more rapidly, with ministries starting in a new area around the world virtually every week. There is freedom out here with Jesus. There is something better than Mormonism. There is a personal day-by-day -day relationship with the only Jesus that has the power to give you eternal life. Missionaries at your door. In 1977 the California Arcadia Mission sent out a directive to the Mormon missionaries entitled, The Baptized Now Plan Teach to Commit Don't Make the People Think Too Much Baptism Must Be Our Prime Goal. We know the missionary strategy well. Many of us were formerly missionaries for the church. When they come to your door, asking to help you start a family home evening, 
or to tell you about their church, ask them to give you the real meat of the gospel is above. Not just the milk that sounds appealing, but is designed to make you doubt your current faith and lead you into a system. They will constantly repeat a testimony of the truthfulness of the church and ask you to read the Book of Mormon and pray about it to receive your own testimony what they want is a feeling or a burning in the bosom. If you ignore the facts, Satan can cause you to experience feelings and sensations. Why not do as recorded in Act 1711 and check the meat of Mormonism out with God's Word, the Bible? Why pray about the Book of Mormon? You say that ex-Mormons for Jesus is growing, but so is wickedness. We live in a time of trouble the time that Jesus said would be filled with false Christs, false prophets, deceptions and strong delusions. The efforts of all these priestcrafters would become so convincing that they would almost deceive the very elect but not quite. These instruments of that old dragon, the devil, which deceiveth the whole world, Rev. 12.9, are really necessary instruments in the Lord's hands to separate the wheat and tares, Matt. 25.33. It is out of this great separation that many will learn that. Dot 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 wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matt. 7 13 to 14. But what is the great dividing line between the rest of the world and those few that find the narrow way? The Apostle Paul warned the Galatians that if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Gal. 1 9. Yet Paul admits, I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. I core. 3 2. But what was worse, the devil's ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. 2 core. 11 15. Apostasy had already occurred in the Christian churches. Paul said, Ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. Heb. 5 12. Jesus said that his faithful and wise servants in the last days would be teaching meat in due season. See Matt. 24 45 to 46 and Luke 12 42. But where is this meat of the gospel among these Protestant churches? All we hear is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Is this strong meat or milk? What are the pearls of the gospel that were not to be cast before this wine? Matt. 7 6. It is evident that today's money market ministers are only peddling milk and they can't even agree on what that is. Talk about confusion in Babylon. The only time they seem to find agreement is when they are maligning Joseph Smith. And now the apostates have joined with them to organize their own little ex-Mormons club to fight their former church. But I know it will do little good to try reclaiming them, for it is almost impossible for those who were once enlightened to renew them again unto repentance. Heb. 6 6. Most of the nations of the earth are calling themselves Christians, yet we live in an age which has brought these nations into military clashes over 150 since World War II. But man will soon see worse things than these famine, pestilence, earthquakes, and disease. Why? Because they have rejected God's restored gospel and fought against his latter-day prophet. Joseph Smith was persecuted and driven nearly all his life, and finally the Christians killed him. When he was driven out of Missouri by mobs, ministers, and government officials, he told them they would soon face the cannon's mouth in war. In detail he described the civil war where it would start, when it would begin, who would be involved, and what the final result would be. He died 15 years before it happened, but it transpired exactly as he said it would. The worst part of the war occurred in the very places that raised most of the hostility against the Mormons. The prophet Joseph Smith also left many more prophecies that will soon come to pass. He gave us many revelations which became scripture, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Dot dot dot. 2 Tim. 3.16, if any of the ministers of today speak by inspiration, where is their scripture and what do they have for doctrine? Do they have any meat or pearls to reveal to us? I have never seen any coming from any other pulpit or any other church. Strange that all these ministers have their religion on men who talked with God but, when a man in our day talks to God, they fight against him. I know there are many good and sincere people among the Protestant churches, and we love all you people, but we just cannot swallow your religious conglomeration of confusion and error. I am convinced, however, that if there is any fault to be found with the Mormon church today, it is only that they are inclined to become a little too much like the rest of your churches. Sincerely, following the leaders Biesra Taft Benson. Versus. Following the Lord Biogden Kraut.
Part I. 14 Fundamentals in Following the Prophet's View Devotional Assembly February 26, 1980 by Zra Taft Benson. Part 2. 14 Fundamentals for Distinguishing True Prophets from False Prophets A Letter to Ezra Taft Benson April 6, 1980 by Ogden Kraut. Part I. 14 Fundamentals in Following the Prophets B. President Ezra Taft Bin Sanbu Devotional Assembly Tuesday, February 26, 1980, 10 a.m. My beloved brothers and sisters. I am honored to be in your presence today. You students are a part of a choice young generation a generation which might well witness the return of our Lord. Not only is the church growing in numbers today, it is growing in faithfulness, and, even more important, our young generation, as a group, is even more faithful than the older generation. God has reserved you for the eleventh hour the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It will be your responsibility not only to help bear off the kingdom of God triumphantly, but to save your own soul and strive to save those of your family and to honor the principles of our inspired constitution. To help you pass the crucial tests which lie ahead, I am going to give you today several facets of a grand key which, if you will honor, will crown you with God's glory and bring you out victorious in spite of Satan's fury. Soon we will be honoring our prophet on his 85th birthday. As a church we sing this song, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet. Here then is the grand key follow the prophet and here now are 14 fundamentals in following the prophet, the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. First. The prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. In section 132, verse 7, of the Doctrine and Covenants the Lord speaks of the prophet the president and says, There is never but one on the earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred. Then in section 21, verses 4 to 6, the Lord states, Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. For by doing these things the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Did you hear what the Lord said about the words of the prophet? We are to give heed unto all his words as, if from the Lord's own mouth. Second, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. President Wilford Woodruff tells of an interesting incident that occurred in the days of the prophet Joseph Smith. I will refer to a certain meeting I attended in the town of Kirtland in my early days. At that meeting some remarks were made that have been made here today, with regard to the living oracles and with regard to the written word of God. The same principle was presented, although not as extensively as it has been here, when a leading man in the church got up and talked upon the subject and said, you have got the word of God before you here in the Bible, Book of Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants. You have the written word of God, and you who give revelations should give revelations according to those books, as what is written in those books is the word of God. We should confine ourselves to them. When he concluded, Brother Joseph turned to Brother Brigham Young and said, backquote B-R-O-T-H-E-R Brigham I want you to take the stand and tell us your views with regard to the living oracles and the written word of God. Brother Brigham took the stand and he took the Bible and laid it down. He took the Book of Mormon and laid it down. And he took the Book of Doctrine and Covenants and laid it down before him. And he said, T-H-E-R-E is the written word of God to us, concerning the work of God from the beginning of the world, almost, to our day. And now, said he, backquote, W-H-E-N compared with the living oracles those books are nothing to me. Those books do not convey the word of God direct to us now, as do the words of a prophet or a man bearing the holy priesthood in our day and generation. I would rather have the living oracles than all the writing in the books. That was the course he pursued. When he was through, Brother Joseph said to the congregation backquote B-R-O-T-H-E-R, -E Brigham has told you the word of the Lord, and he has told you the truth. C.R. October 1897, pages 18 to 19. Third, the living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. The living prophet has the power of TNT. By that I mean today's news today. God's revelations to Adam did not instruct Noah how to build the ark. Noah needed his own revelation. Therefore the most important prophet so far as you and I are concerned, is the one living in our day and age to whom the Lord is currently revealing his will for us. Therefore the most important reading we can do is any of the words of the prophet contained each week in the church section of the Deseret News, and any words of the prophet contained each month in our church magazines. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the general conference addresses which are printed in the Ensign magazine.
I am so grateful that the current conference report is studied as part of one of your religion classes the course, entitled Teachings of the Living Prophets No. 333. May I commend that class to you and suggest that you get a copy of the class manual at your bookstore, whether you're able to take the class or not. The manual is entitled Living Prophets for a Living Church for Religion Course No. 333. Beware of those who would pit the dead prophets against the living prophets, for the living prophets always take precedence. Fourth. The prophet will never lead the church astray. President Wilfred Woodruff stated, I say to Israel, the Lord will never permit me, or any other man who stands as president of the church to lead you astray. It is not in the program. It is not in the mind of God. The Discourses of Wilfred Woodruff, pages 212 to 213. President Marion G. Romney tells of this incident which happened to him. I remember years ago when I was a bishop I had President, Heber J. Grant talked to our ward. After the meeting I drove him home. Standing by men, he put his arm over my shoulder and said, backquote M. Y. Boy, you always keep your eye on the president of the church, and if he ever tells you to do anything, and it is wrong, and you do it, the Lord will bless you for it. Then with a twinkle in his eye, he said backquote B. U. T. You don't need to worry. The Lord will never let his mouthpiece lead the people astray. CR, October 1960, page 78. Fifth, the prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or credentials to speak on any subject or act on any matter at any time. Sometimes there are those who feel their earthly knowledge on a certain subject is superior to the heavenly knowledge which God gives to his prophet on the same subject. They feel the prophet must have the same earthly credentials or training which they have had before they will accept anything the prophet has to say that might contradict their earthly schooling. How much earthly schooling did Joseph Smith have? Yet he gave revelations on all kinds of subjects. We haven't yet had a prophet who earned a doctorate degree in any subject, but as someone said, a prophet may not have his PhD, but he certainly has his LDS. We encourage earthly knowledge in many areas, but remember if there is ever a conflict between earthly knowledge and the words of the prophet, you stand with the prophet and you'll be blessed, and time will vindicate you. Sixth. The prophet does not have to say, thus saith the Lord to give a scripture. Sometimes there are those who haggle over words. They might say the prophet gave us counsel, but that we are not obligated to follow it, unless he says it is a commandment. But the Lord says of the prophet, Thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments which he shall give unto you. D&C 21.4. And speaking of taking counsel from the prophet, in the D&C 108.1, the Lord states, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, My servant Lyman, your sins are forgiven you, because you have obeyed my voice in coming up hither this morning to receive counsel of him whom I have appointed. Said Brigham Young, I have never yet preached a sermon, and sent it out to the children of men, that they may not call scripture. J.D. 1395. Seventh, the prophet tells us, what we need to know, not always what we want to know. Thou hast declared unto us hard things, more than we are able to bear complained Nephi's brethren. But Nephi answered by saying, the guilty taketh the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. 1 Nephi 16 1, 3, or to put it in another prophet's words, hid pigeons flutter. Said President Harold B. Lee. You may not like what comes from the authority of the church. It may contradict your political views. It may contradict your social views. It may interfere with some of your social life. Your safety and ours depends upon whether or not we follow. Let's keep our eye on the president of the church. CR, October 1970, page 152-53. But it is the living prophet who really upsets the world. Even in the church said President Kimball, many are prone to garnish the sepulchres of yesterday's prophets and mentally stone the living ones. Instructor 95-257. Why? Because the living prophet gets at what we need to know now, and the world prefers that prophets either be dead or mind their own business. Some so-called experts of political science want the prophet to keep still on politics. Some would-be authorities on evolution want the prophet to keep still on evolution. And so the list goes on and on. How we respond to the words of a living prophet when he tells us what we need to know, but would rather not hear, is a test of our faithfulness. Said President Marion G. Romney, it is an easy thing to believe in the dead prophets, but it is a greater thing to believe in the living prophets. And then he gives this illustration, one day when President Grant was living, I sat in my office across the street following a general conference. A man came over to see me, an elderly man. He was very upset about what had been said in this conference by some of the brethren, including myself. 
I could tell from his speech that he came from a foreign land. After I had quieted him enough so he would listen, I said, why did you come to America? I am here because a prophet of God told me to come. Who was the prophet? I continued. Wilfred Woodruff do you believe Wilfred Woodruff was a prophet of God? Yes, I do. Do you believe that President Joseph F. Smith was a prophet of God? Yes, sir. Then came the $64 question. Do you believe that Heber J. Grant is a prophet of God? His answer, I think he ought to keep his mouth shut about old age assistance. Now I tell you that a man in his position is on the way to apostasy. He is forfeiting his chances for eternal life. So is everyone who can't follow the living prophet of God. CR, April 1953, page 125. 8. The prophet is not limited by men's reasoning. There will be times when you will have to choose between the revelations of God and reasoning of men between the prophet and the politician or professor. Said the prophet Joseph Smith. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof until long after the events transpire. Scrapbook of Mormon Literature, Vol. 2, page 173. Would it seem reasonable to an eye doctor to be told to heal a blind man by spitting in the dirt, making clay and applying it to the man's eyes, and then telling him to wash in a contaminated pool? Yet this is precisely the course that Jesus took with one man, and he was healed. See John 9 6-7, does it seem reasonable to cure leprosy by telling a man to wash seven times in a particular river, yet this is precisely what the prophet Elisha told the leper to do, and he was healed. See 2 Kings 5. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55 8, 9. N-I-N-T-H, the prophet can receive revelation on any matter temporal or spiritual. Said Brigham Young. Some of the leading men in Kirtland were much opposed to Joseph the prophet, meddling with temporal affairs. In a public meeting of the saints, I said, backquote why ye elders of Israel, will some of you draw the line of demarcation between the spiritual and temporal in the kingdom of God, so that I may understand it? Not one of them could do it. I defy any man on earth to point out the path a prophet of God should walk in, or point out his duty, and just how far he must go, in dictating temporal or spiritual things. Temporal and spiritual things are inseparably connected, and ever will be. JD 10 363-364. TENTH, the prophet may be involved in civic matters. When a people are righteous, they want the best to lead them in government. Alma was the head of the church, and of the government in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith was mayor of Nauvoo and Brigham Young was governor of Utah. Isaiah was deeply involved in giving counsel on political matters, and of his words the Lord himself said, Great are the words of Isaiah. 3 Nephi 23 1, those who would remove prophets from politics, would take God out of government. 11 The two groups who have the greatest difficulty in following the prophet are the proud who are learned, and the proud who are rich. The learned may feel the prophet is only inspired when he agrees with them, otherwise the prophet is just giving his opinion speaking as a man. The rich may feel they have no need to take counsel of a lowly prophet. In the Book of Mormon we read. Oh that cunning plan of the evil one. Oh the vainness, and the frailties, and the foolishness of men. When they are learned they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves, wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not. And they shall perish. But to be learned, is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. And woe so knocketh, to him will he open. And the wise, and the learned, and they that are rich, who are puffed up, because of their learning, and their wisdom, and their riches yea, they are they whom he despiseth. And say they shall cast these things away, and consider themselves fools before God, and come down in the depths of humility, he will not open unto them. 2 Nevi 9 28, 29, 42. 12. The prophet will not necessarily be popular with the world or the worldly. As a prophet reveals the truth, it divides the people. The honest in heart heed his words, but the unrighteous either ignore the prophet or fight him. When the prophet points out the sins of the world, the worldly either want to close the mouth of the prophet, or else act as if the prophet didn't exist, rather than repent of their sins. Popularity is never a test of truth. Many a prophet has been killed or cast out. As we come closer to the Lord's second coming, you can expect that as the people of the world become more wicked, the prophet will be less popular with them. 13. The prophet and his counselors make up the first presidency the highest quorum in the church. 
In the Doctrine and Covenants the Lord refers to the First Presidency as the highest council of the Church, 10780, and says, Whosoever receiveth me, receiveth those, the First Presidency, whom I have sent, 11220. Fourteenth. The Prophet and the Presidency The Living Prophet and the First Presidency follow them and be blessed reject them and suffer. President Harold B. Lee relates this incident from church history, the story is told in the early days of the church particularly, I think, at Kirtland where, some of the leading brethren in the presiding councils of the church, met secretly, and tried to scheme as to how they could get rid of the Prophet Joseph's leadership. They made the mistake of inviting Brigham Young to one of these secret meetings. He rebuked them, after he had heard the purpose of their meeting. This is part of what he said, backquote why oh you cannot destroy the appointment of a prophet of God, but you can cut the thread that binds you to the prophet of God and sink yourselves to hell. CR, April 1963, page 81. In a general conference of the church, President N. Eldon Tanner stated. The prophet spoke out clearly on Friday morning, telling us what our responsibilities are. A man said to me after that backquote why oh you, no, there are people in our state who believe in following the prophet in everything they think is right, but when it is something they think isn't right, and it doesn't appeal to them, then that's different. He said backquote t-h-e-n, they become their own prophet. They decide what the Lord wants and what the Lord doesn't want. I thought how true and how serious when we begin to choose which of the covenants, which of the commandments we will keep and follow. When we decide that there are some of them that we will not keep or follow, we are taking the law of the Lord into our own hands and become our own prophets, and believe me, we will be led astray, because we are false prophets to ourselves when we do not follow the prophet of God. No, we should never discriminate between these commandments, as to those we should and should not keep. CR, October 1966, page 124, verse 84, the Lord states. And with my servant Alman Babbitt, there are many things with which I am not pleased, behold, he aspired to establish his counsel instead of the counsel which I have ordained, even that of the presidency of my church. In conclusion let us summarize this grand key, these 14 fundamentals in following the prophet for our salvation hangs on them. First, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. Second, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. Third, the living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. Fourth, the prophet will never lead the church astray. Fifth, the prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or credentials to speak on any subject or act on any matter at any time. Sixth, the prophet does not have to say thus saith the Lord to give a scripture. Seventh, the prophet tells us what we need to know, not always what we want to know. Eighth, the prophet is not limited by men's reasoning. N-I-N-T-H, the prophet can receive revelation on any matter, temporal or spiritual. T-E-N-T-H, the prophet may be involved in civic matters. Eleventh, the two groups who have the greatest difficulty in following the prophet are the proud who are learned and the proud who are rich. Twelfth, the prophet will not necessarily be popular with the world or the worldly. Thirteenth, the prophet and his counselors make up the first presidency the highest quorum in the church. Fourteenth, the prophet and the presidency the living prophet and the first presidency follow them and be blessed reject them and suffer. I testify that these 14 fundamentals in following the living prophet are true. If we want to know how well we stand with the Lord, then let us ask ourselves how well we stand with his mortal captain how close do our lives harmonize with the words of the Lord's anointed the living prophet president of the church and with the quorum of the first presidency. May God bless us all to look to the prophet and the presidency in the critical and crucial days ahead is my prayer. Part 2. April 6, 1980. President Ezra T. Benson Church Office B.U.I.L.D.I.N.G. 47 East South Temple Salt Lake City, Utah 84103. Dear President Benson, it was with particular interest that I listened to your lecture to the Brigham Young University Student Assembly on February 26, 1980, on the subject of following the prophets. However, it appears that one important and essential factor was overlooked. If we are to obtain the blessings we anticipate by following the prophets, we must first make the proper distinction between true prophets and false prophets. Our salvation depends upon which kind of prophets we choose to follow. It was prophesied that in the last days there would be an abundance of both false and true prophets. This is certainly evident today, as many are claiming to be prophets, but since they are contradicting each other, they cannot all be true prophets. As Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives with his apostles, Peter asked him what would be the signs of his coming. 
the first response Jesus made was, take heed that no man deceive you. In other words deception would be one of the major signs of his coming, and he warned, many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Matt. 24:11. deception by false prophets is perhaps the most damaging power and influence of the latter days, but it is a purifying process that is very necessary. Paul the Apostle said that God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that all might be damned who believe not the truth. 2 Thess. 2:12. The prophet Joseph Smith has also warned. When a man goes about prophesying and commands men to obey his teachings, he must either be a true or false prophet. False prophets always arise to oppose the true prophets, and they will prophesy so very near the truth that they will deceive almost the very chosen ones. TPJS, page 365. But the false prophets are just as necessary as the true ones, which God revealed to Apostle Orson Hyde by saying, Evil men, ambitious of power, must needs arise among you, and they shall be led by their own self-will, and not by me. Yet they are instruments in my hands, and are permitted to try my people, and to collect from among them those who are not the elect, and such as are unworthy of eternal life. Grieve not after them, neither more nor be alarmed. My people know my voice, and also the voice of my spirit, and a stranger they will not follow, therefore such as follow strangers are not my people. Unpublished Revelations, compiled by Fred Collier, page 104-105, part 65-3-6. When people use the proper keys of knowledge for detecting false prophets, then these false prophets become as evident to them as when the innocent child looked upon a naked emperor and declared that he had no clothes. These keys are necessary to help us pass the crucial tests which lie ahead so that we will be victorious in spite of Satan's deceptions. I have written 14 simple fundamentals used to expose false prophets, which you should find interesting. I call them 14 fundamentals for distinguishing true prophets from false prophets. First. False prophets always teach infallibility. A week after you delivered your lecture to the BYU students, Pope John Paul delivered a sermon at Rome in which he said. Belief in the infallibility of the church does not mean in any sense believing in the infallibility of man, but rather in the gift of Christ, in that gift which permits fallible men to infallibly proclaim and confess the revealed truth of our salvation. Here then is one of the common declarations inferring that some men's words are the infallible words of God. How often we have heard religious leaders erroneously say, when our leaders speak, the thinking has been done. When they propose a plan, it is God's plan. Or, we should always follow our leaders for they will never lead anyone astray, and we are safe, if we put our trust in our leaders. Claim of infallibility is really a cover-up for personal failure. When men find themselves incapable of receiving God's word, then they make this substitution by saying their own words are infallible. It is impossible for infallibility to exist among the leadership in even the true Church of Christ, for, as the prophet Joseph Smith explained, the people should each one stand for himself and depend on no man or men in that state of corruption of the Jewish Church, he was reading from Ezekiel, that righteous persons could only deliver their own souls applied it to the present state of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints said. If the people departed from the Lord, they must fall that they were depending on the prophet, hence were darkened in their minds, TPJS, pages 237 to 238. Second. False prophets teach and practice priestcraft. A false prophet must live by priestcraft, or else he will fail to obtain the power and means necessary for his survival. Without priestcraft, a false prophet cannot have a following, nor the material means of support that he needs. The larger his following, the larger his financial support will be. Priestcraft is a craft, or business, that renders financial remuneration for being a priest. Priestcrafters accept money from their followers in tithing, offerings, or gifts with a promise that God will shower blessings upon them for their financial support. Priestcrafters then place these tithings and donations into investments, banking, insurance, business enterprises, and even for personal living expenses. To accomplish this kind of priestcraft, false prophets instruct their followers to put all their trust in their leadership without question. Nephi Best described this kind of priestcraft by explaining that. He God commanded that there shall be no priestcrafts, for, behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. 2 Nephi 26 29. But true prophets have always warned people, not to put their trust in the arm of flesh. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. 2 Nevi 434. 
Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. Jer. 17.5. The weak things of the world shall come forth, and break down the mighty and strong ones, that man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh. D&C 119. And President Brigham Young also warned the saints, how often has it been taught that, if you depend entirely upon the voice, judgment, and sagacity of those appointed to lead you, and neglect to enjoy the spirit for yourselves, how easily you may be led into error, and finally be cast off to the left hand. JD 859. Now those men are those women who know no more about the powers of God and the influences of the Holy Spirit than to be led entirely by another person, suspending their own understanding and pinning their faith upon another's sleeve, will never be capable of entering into the celestial glory to be crowned as they anticipate. They never will be capable of becoming gods. JD 1 312. Let every man and woman know themselves, whether their leaders are walking in the path the Lord dictates or not. This has been my exhortation continually. JD 9 150. When a true prophet speaks, he admonishes men to follow God, Jesus Christ, and the dictates of the Holy Spirit. He urges men to place these three as their personal guide, and not some mortal man. Third, false prophets place their teachings above the scriptures. When a man proclaims that his own words take precedence over the scriptures, it is usually because his teachings contradict the scriptures. A subtle trick of false prophets is to say that their words can justifiably contradict the doctrine of the scriptures because those principles are no longer in vogue for our day. Joseph Smith taught, however, if any man writes to you or preaches to you doctrines contrary to the Bible, the Book of Mormon, or the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, set him down as an impostor. Times and Seasons, April 1, 1844. Even the Savior of the world taught that men should search the scriptures, John 5 3.9, because they pointed the correct way towards eternal life. And again he said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Matt. 5.19. The prophet Joseph Smith would have agreed with the following statement, If the principles by which any of us attempt to save ourselves are contrary to the Bible, we may know they are man's teachings, not God's for the Lord and his gospel remain the same always. Church News, June 5, 1965, page 16. And from the scriptures, to the law, and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isa. 8.20 and 2 Nephi 18.20. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Luke 16.31. Even a more recent authority stated, Joseph Fielding Smith. If I ever say anything which is contrary to the scriptures, then the scriptures prevail. Church News, August 23, 1975. Fourth, false prophets live by worldly standards. Very few people in the world recognize a true prophet. It has always been that when a true prophet came into the world, the world rejected him. The prophet Joseph Smith explained, the world always mistook false prophets for true ones, and those that were sent of God, they considered to be false prophets, and hence they killed, stoned, punished and imprisoned the true prophets, and these had to hide themselves in deserts and dens, and caves of the earth, and though the most honorable men of the earth, they banished there from their society as vagabonds, whilst they cherished, honored and supported knaves, vagabonds, hypocrites, impostors, and the basest of men. TPJS, page 206. Jesus also told his disciples of this fact when he said, Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Matt. 5.11-12. False prophets will be honored by the political leaders of the world. Gentile ministers will heap platitudes and laurels to their name. The worldly will recognize their own. There is one principal reason for persecution to cease. When the spirit of persecution, the spirit of hatred, of wrath and malice ceases in the world against this people, it will be the time that this people have apostatized and joined hands with the wicked. Brigham Young, J.D. 4 327. When all the chief features of the gospel are obliterated, when we can float along the stream and do as the world does, then and not until then will persecution cease. George Q. Cannon, J.D. 22 374. Fifth, false prophets contradict eternal doctrines of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness is a stumbling block to every false prophet. 
they find it to be an offense to their teachings and to their objectives. A false prophet will try to alter, discard, or condemn the true doctrines of Christ. How often false prophets garnish the sepulchres of the former prophets, yet contradict every doctrine they taught. But there should be no contradiction of doctrines because they are eternal, everlasting and unchangeable. How can a prophet change an unchangeable doctrine? How can an eternal law of the gospel be substituted by any other law? But false prophets always seem to be on hand to make substitutions for the laws of God. However, God has said, What I the Lord have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away. D&C 138. An editorial in the Church News a few years ago explains the eternal nature of the unchangeable gospel. One of the most important things we may learn about our religion is that God is unchangeable, the same yesterday, today and forever. By this we may know that the principles of salvation will always remain the same, and that we need not be disturbed by new ideas or modern innovations in the gospel which may come our way. The gospel cannot possibly be changed. The heaven we hope to achieve is eternal and unchangeable. Therefore, to bring the same human nature to the same goal, regardless of the time in which a person lives, requires the same steps and procedures. For that reason the saving principles must ever be the same. They can never change. Church News, June 5, 1965, page 16. All true prophets have advocated the same principles and doctrines in every dispensation. Now taking it for granted that the scriptures say what they mean, and mean what they say, we have sufficient grounds to go on and prove from the Bible that the gospel has always been the same, the ordinances to fulfill its requirements, the same, and the officers to officiate, the same. And the signs and fruits resulting from the promises, the same. Joseph Smith, TPJS, page 264. Only false prophets teach conflicting doctrine. They try to enter heaven by another set of doctrines and ordinances, but Jesus cautioned his followers. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up same other way, the same as a thief and a robber. John 10 1. False prophets veer the words of dead prophets because one or the other must be wrong. For this reason they attempt to cover up or set aside the teachings of the true prophets, lest the people discover the deceiver. The prophet Joseph Smith gave the key to know what comes from God and what comes from the devil. A key, every principle proceeding from God, is eternal and any principle which is not eternal is of the devil. TPJS, page 181. Sixth, false prophets try to be the mediator between man and God. When men arise to positions of leadership, they are tempted with their power and influence. They want to become the phyletter standing between men and God. But, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me. John 14 6. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I Tim. 2 5. The reason no man can be a mediator is because there is not a just man upon earth, that doeth good, and sinneth not. Ek. 8 20, Prof. 29, I John 1 8. And President Brigham Young taught, the greatest and most important of all requirements of our Father in heaven, and of his Son Jesus Christ, is, to his brethren or disciples, to believe in Jesus Christ, confess him, seek to him, cling to him, make friends with him. Take a course to open and keep open a communication with your elder brother or phyleter or savior. JD 8 339. A false prophet wants to be a phyleter or mediator between men and God, because of the authority it gives him over others. But gods of stone and wood do less damage than these false prophets who act as mediators with God. Seventh, false prophets cannot say thus saith the Lord. True prophets have always brought the word of the Lord to the nations of the world. The ancient prophets of Israel would have been laughed at and scorned if they had tried to tell people that whatever they said was God's word without the endorsement of thus saith the Lord. False prophets cannot obtain the word of the Lord because God does not speak to them. For this reason they must pretend to receive the word of God, but they can never produce it. God spoke to Ezekiel and told him to warn every false prophet by saying. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophecy, and say thou unto them that prophecy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets, that follow their own spirit, and have seen nothing. Ezek. 13 1-3. The prophet Joseph Smith gave us this important key for determining what is binding from the Lord. 
If anything should have been suggested by us, or any names mentioned, except by commandment, or thus saith the Lord, we do not consider it binding, DHC 3 295. If a revelation from God had the endorsement of thus smith the Lord anciently then it should certainly be so in our day. 8. False prophets do not speak by power of the Holy Ghost. It is written, that Jesus spoke as one having authority, and not as the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus spoke by the spirit and power of prophecy and revelation, but false prophets always depend on their own education and learning. The false prophets write out their sermons beforehand and require others to do the same. They have no confidence or faith in the Holy Spirit to dictate their preaching neither do they trust people who do. The Savior taught his disciples, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Matt. 10 19-20. The Lord also commanded the members of his church in these last days to conduct all meetings in this same manner. But notwithstanding those things which are written, it always has been given to the elders of my church from the beginning, and ever shall be, to conduct all meetings as they are directed and guided by the Holy Spirit. D&C 46 2. Missionary work must also be done by the Spirit and not by the letter. This was a firm requirement of the missionaries in this dispensation. Therefore, verily I say unto you, lift up your voices unto this people, speak the thoughts that I shall put into your hearts, and you shall not be confounded before men, for it shall be given you in the very hour, yea, in the very moment, what ye shall say. D&C 105-6. The great missionary Alma was a noble example of this system of missionary work, for he said, I have been called to preach the word of God among all this people, according to the spirit of revelation and prophecy, Alma 8:24. Alma never used a missionary guidebook. The Latter-day Saints let the Spirit dictate in all of their meetings as Apostle George A. Smith said, with the Latter-day Saints the idea of writing sermons or preparing addresses beforehand is entirely discarded. It never was practiced amongst them. J.D. 13 292. And President Wilford would have added, it is well known to the Latter-day Saints though perhaps not to strangers, that no elder or member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who enters into this tabernacle knows who is going to be called upon to speak to the people. Hence no man spends a week, a day, an hour, or a moment to prepare a discourse to deliver unto the people. We are all of us dependent upon the Spirit of the Lord, upon revelation, upon inspiration, upon the Holy Ghost, in order to be qualified to teach the people before whom we are called to speak, JD 24 236. False prophets must depend on their worldly education for their sermons. You can spot those impostors everywhere you see them reading their sermons. This is a key by which they are known, hence the folly of sermons written beforehand. And unless the written beforehand sermons are by revelation or prophecy, all men the world over may know when they hear a sermon read from the pulpit that God has no hand in that matter, and the preacher is not sent of God and is not God's servant. Editorial, Day. News, September 4, 1852. Readers of sermons do not teach by the Holy Ghost. They do not speak by the Holy Ghost. They are not sent of God, and certainly God has no hand in any of their sermons. N-I-N-T-H, false prophets do not enjoy the gifts of the Holy Spirit. A false prophet claims to be the vicar of Christ, or his prophet, seer, and revelator. Yet there is almost no evidence that he is. He does not have the gift of translation, the gift of tongues, he has no seer stone or urim and thummim, he never speaks with the gift of prophecy, and has that prophecy fulfilled, he bears no testimony of seeing angels or having visions, nor has he ever talked face to face with God or Christ. True prophets have said, because faith is wanting, the fruits are. No man since the world was, had faith without having something along with it. A man who has none of the gifts has no faith. And he deceives himself, if he supposes he has. Joseph Smith, TPJS, page 270. All these gifts of which I have spoken, which are spiritual, never will be done away, even as long as the world shall stand, only according to the unbelief of the children of men. Star. And woe be unto the children of men if this be the case, for there shall be none that doeth good among you, no not one. Moroni 10 19, 25. And it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men, wherefore, if these things have ceased woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, Moroni 7 37. False prophets are impostors. They claim things which they do not have. 
they make a pretext of being close to God and enjoying his gifts, but they have failed to be blessed with such gifts. Because the gifts of the Spirit are absent, so are the influence and power of God. T-E-N-T-H, false prophets honor the laws of the land over the laws of God. False prophets do not condemn many of the sins of people, states and nations, nor the folly of other false prophets. On the contrary, they seek their fellowship and association. False prophets find great happiness in the goodwill and friendship of the world. Instead of persecution, they sacrifice principles of the gospel to attain these happy associations. Their counsel is to encourage business according to the practices of the world and sustain every law of the land, no matter if it be unjust, unrighteous or against the gospel of Jesus Christ. When this problem arose with the disciples of Christ, it was resolved. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5 29. This is evident, for we know that he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. D&C 88:22. Abraham, Daniel and the three Hebrews were all breakers of the law of the land. True prophets live by the laws of God, even if they must suffer the consequences of breaking the laws of men. False prophets are willing to abandon the laws of God and justify it by obeying the laws of the land. True prophets exhibit courage as Joseph Smith did when he said, It mattereth not whether the principle is popular or unpopular, I will always maintain a true principle, even if I stand alone in it. DHZ 6223. The prophet also wrote. We believe that religion is instituted of God, and that men are amenable to him, and to him only, for the exercise of it, unless their religious opinions prompt them to infringe upon the rights and liberties of others. But we do not believe that human law has a right to interfere in prescribing rules of worship to bind the consciences of men, nor dictate forms for public or private devotion, that the civil magistrate should restrain crime, but never control conscience, should punish guilt, but never suppress the freedom of the soul. D&C 134 11. False prophets are wolves that scatter the sheep. False prophets tell the sheep, or the saints of God, to remain in their native countries, and by so doing, the kingdom of God can grow and prosper and that God will bless them for doing so. But God never said that. In Latter-day Revelation, it is recorded that God will gather out the saints from the Gentiles, and then comes desolation and destruction, and none can escape except the pure in heart who are gathered. DHC 252. The gathering of the saints is a very important item of our faith. It is founded upon divine revelation, both ancient and modern. None of the saints can be dilatory upon this subject and still retain the Spirit of God. To neglect or be indifferent about gathering is just as displeasing in the sight of God as to neglect or be indifferent about baptism for the remission of sins. Mill. Star 10 241. If men have not the spirit of gathering, they are blind and cannot see afar off and are nigh unto burning. Mill. Star 9 310. The keys of gathering were given to Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple by Moses to gather the house of Israel. Those keys were never taken back, so the commandment of gathering is still in force. Furthermore, they were to gather in unto one place upon the face of this land. D&C 29.8, the gathering must continue until the destruction of the wicked occurs. When the gospel went forth among the people, after the appearance of Moses in the temple, and the committing of the keys of the gathering, when you Latter-day Saints received the gospel of baptism for remission of sins and the laying on of hands for the reception of the Holy Ghost, you also received the spirit of the gathering. John Taylor, J.D. 19 125. True prophets have given the warning. What is Babylon? Why, it is the confused world, come out of her then, and cease to partake of her sins, for if you do not, you will be partakers of her plagues. Brigham Young, J.D. 12 282. It is the word and commandment of the Lord to his servants, that they shall never do another day's work, nor spend another dollar, to build up a Gentile city or nation. Joseph Smith, J.D. 11 294 5. But false prophets scatter the sheep of Israel leaving them to be destroyed with the wicked nations of the earth. And God has said, Woe be unto the pastors, that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Jer. 23 1. Then God proceeds to tell these wicked pastors that he will bring the evil of their doing upon them. God wants his people to be together, unitedly living every higher principle of the gospel, but the false prophets encourage them to live with the rest of the world in a scattered condition. 12. False prophets do not bring people to God. Since false prophets have never seen or talked to God, it is certain they can never show anyone else how to do so. 
the mission of a true prophet is to teach others how to enjoy the gifts, powers and personal manifestation of their Savior, Jesus Christ. True prophets tell people how to get such revelations for themselves. False prophets, on the other hand, tell people they themselves will get all the necessary revelations. But Joseph Smith said, reading the experience of others or the revelation given to them can never give us a comprehensive view of our condition and true relation to God. TPJS, page 324. And President Brigham Young added. Without revelation direct from heaven, it is impossible for any person to understand fully the plan of salvation. I say that the living oracles of God or the spirit of revelation must be in each and every individual to know the plan of salvation and keep in the path that leads them to the presence of God. Disc. A Brigham Young, page 58. Note, he gives the definition of living oracles as being the spirit of revelation it is not man. God also has given many reasons for men to receive direct revelation from him, but the foremost reason was that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. D&C 120. President Heber C. Kimball prophesied that a testing time was coming when men could not simply put their trust in their leaders to show them the way to God. He said. To meet the difficulties that are coming, it will be necessary for you to have a knowledge of the truth of this work for yourselves. The difficulties will be of such a character that the man or woman who does not possess this personal knowledge or witness will fall. The time will come when no man nor woman will be able to endure on borrowed light. Each will have to be guided by the light within himself. Life of Heber C. Kimball, pages 460-61. Also Golden Kimball, page 365. And President Joseph F. Smith said that particular testing time had arrived. The time has arrived in the history of this people when every Latter-day Saint must stand on his own responsibility as a tub stands on its own bottom. Dot dot dot. Truth 288. September 1903. Since we are no longer tested with mobs, armies, crickets, famine, poverty, unjust laws, hostile Indians, etc., it is evident that we are undergoing another kind of test. The only test that we can ascertain now is that of deception. Every member must assume the responsibility of receiving revelation for his own guidance. True prophets do not bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost on new members for guidance and then tell them to follow the brethren. Thirteenth, false prophets do not honor personal rights of freedom. During the Dark Ages men were told by their ecclesiastical leaders that they must believe what they were told to believe or they would be punished. If members of the church were suspected of believing something other than what the church taught, they were told to sign prepared documents. These statements of belief had to be signed or they would suffer excommunication. False prophets still use this mode of coercion and compulsion. However, those who use these wicked tactics are stripped of their priesthood, if they have any dot, see D&C 121 37, instead of opposing tyranny, they practice it. Free men can live by pure reason, the scriptures and the dictates of the Holy Ghost, but these things expose the false prophets. For this reason, phony prophets must dominate the thinking and beliefs of the people. The quickest and surest way to make men conform to their mandates is to force them to sign these prepared documents of belief. Sometimes they are brave enough to call them in privately and question them. But coercion and extortion of the mind is the false prophet's objective and his only defense. The prophet Joseph Smith said, I will not seek to compel any man to believe as I do, only by the force of reasoning. TPJS page 313, he demonstrated this in the case of Palaya Brown, who was called in by the High Council and questioned on his interpretations of the Bible. I did not like the old man being called up for erring in doctrine. It looks too much like the Methodist and not like the Latter-day Saints. Methodists have creeds which a man must believe or be asked out of their church. I want the liberty of thinking and believing as I please. It feels so good not to be trammeled. It does not prove that a man is not a good man because he errs in doctrine. DHC 5340. True prophets respect the freedom of conscience. They affirm that the Spirit of God is the Spirit of freedom. A true prophet will never enter into the sacred precincts of the mind, but a false prophet always does. Fourteenth, false prophets are known by their fruits. Jesus taught his disciples to judge a tree by its fruit. Rotten fruit, or a wicked society, reflects the kind of leadership that it comes from. A society filled with crime and corruption is a reflection upon the kind of leadership that either created it or else tolerates it. False prophets dwell in the midst of the wicked and the worldly. Their environment is identified by the same abominations as any other Gentile city of Babylon. 
the crimes of murder, rape, adultery, robbery, dope addiction, add every other kind of corruption that plagues the rest of the nations will also be found around false prophets. Even businesses, schools, entertainment, fashions, etc., are molded after the devil's gentile system. False prophets either do nothing or can do nothing to change it. These worldly attributes were practically unknown in Salt Lake City for many years after they settled this valley. However, there has been a gradual change, as Joseph F. Smith noted many years ago. There was a time when we could walk up and down the streets and tell by the very countenances of men whether they were Latter-day Saints or not. But can you do it now? You cannot, unless you have greater discernment and more of the spirit and power of God than I have. Why? Because many are trying as hard as they can to transform themselves into the very shape, character and spirit of the world. JD 11 310. And things have gradually been getting worse, even since his day. In a speech by Eugene E. Campbell entitled This Was the Place, in July 23, 1959, he observed. Utah is rapidly succumbing to the wave of uniformity that has been growing in the nation. Our system of transportation, communication, our nationwide TV, radio, chain stores, packaged food, theater chains, clothing styles, are rapidly ending our uniqueness. We are no longer a peculiar people. Speeches of the Year, Extension Publications, page 9. By the fruits of Salt Lake City society, it appears that false prophets have slipped in amongst us. Wolves in sheep's clothes.